Good afternoon, and thank you for joining part three of our webinar series here at Surface Tech. My name is Joe Dennis. I'm the vice president and CTO of Surface Tech, and really glad to have you uh, yet again here. This is our third webinar in six weeks. And uh, today's topic is Asphalt Producers 101, or really what everybody needs to know with regards to uh, how you use our product uh, during uh, plant production. Uh, and uh, just as a reminder today, uh, as, as an attendee, your audio is automatically muted. So if you have any questions, please use the question bar and submit those uh, to Phil and I, and uh, we'll be uh, doing our best to answer those during the webinar and may even uh, use some of those questions uh, out, uh, out loud uh, verbally. So uh, again, thanks for being here today. Uh, there will be a follow-up email tomorrow with your uh, certificate of participation. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and kick it off as uh, we have many attendees just jumping on. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Steve Santa Cruz. He is our uh, president at Surface Tech. And as, uh, as usual, he has a few words to say here on our third webinar. Steve, take it away. Thank you, Joe. Yes, I'm Steve Santa Cruz, president of Surface Tech, and welcome to Surface Tech's sponsorship of what has been to date a very exciting three-part series on asphalt technologies. This is our last series session and will be co-presented and co-moderated by Phil Blankenship of Blankenship Asphalt and Tech and Training of Richmond, Kentucky. Uh, Joe Dennis, obviously, our vice president and CTO out of Ohio. And with us today also is Mike Scardina, our regional sales director out of Denver, Colorado. The three experts you'll have here will guide you through first the embrace states now have with a balanced mix design approach and related performance testing requirements. Second, our products measure up. And third, how this all manifests for the producer's considerations and benefit. All wrap with important value proposition tenants. And I want to really kind of underscore that for you. Value proposition tenants that include cost savings, very important one, performance enhancements, ease of use and availability, and a sustainability story. You're in for a treat and likely you'll come away learning something new about something very old. We have another large audience today and very much appreciate the attendance team will keep it moving fast and we're confident you'll appreciate our content. Online platforms have been hard hit, so be patient if any tech issues arise. We'll muscle through with that, if at all ever. And just a note to remind everyone to keep up the good social disciplines that are our new norm. Distancing, hand washing, and proper PPE are critical to keep embracing. Hopefully by doing so, we can confidently begin this re-entrance to what's surely going to be a new business interfacing of tomorrow. And like many on the session today within their own company, Surface Tech stands strong as a leading new technologies manufacturer and supplier that has readied itself to address this need in a difficult period. Like you, we stand strong and at the end, ready with ample inventories and serviceability at plant sites for what now is our season start we're proud of our folks and their disciplines to keep the job, to get the job done the right, right the first time and help our fellow contractors in that same manner. As Surface Tech's president, I have the privilege of leading a team of innovative minded associates and affiliates through our industry's guideposts that account for the acceptance of new technologies. As much art as science, but the science is what allows the art to be specified and used. And at Surface Tech, we have worked hard and invested significant dollars and time ensuring for our product efficacies and industry acceptance. We take the science seriously. Also, and very important to note, the shutdown will wield significant impacts on our industry. Out of sight these last four and a half months, but certainly not out of mind. Technology such as Surface Techs, with its testing and proven track records intact, will be much needed as confident options to the raw material impacts that will start to show in the summer of 2020. Prior mentioned value props of cost savings, performance, availability, and ease of use will drive decisions in order to meet demand. More on that later in the presentation, but we do stand at the ready. 
So without any further ado, let's get this party started. Joe Dennis, please take it away. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. And uh, welcome again, everybody, to our uh, part three of our webinar series. Uh, we're <clears throat> really excited to have you uh, with us again. And uh, let's go ahead and, and get started with today's agenda. We have a lot to cover today. Uh, we are going to start off today with kind of an overview of the balanced mix design. This will kind of be the third time we've, we've touched on this, but it's so critical uh, to understand performance testing, how we fit into that with our products and how it's become kind of the backbone of uh, maybe ways uh, to improve and or uh, come up with uh, alternatives here in the, in the short run. So lab testing, very critical. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, COVID-19, the fallout and what could be expected in the marketplace. Um, we'll go through the rest of our uh, product uh, uh, testing, our products uh, in general, ASEXP and Army. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, performance and uh, testing and then of course uh, R&D. Um, and then uh, Mr. Scardina is gonna get on and, and talk to us a little bit about uh, uh, the innovative uh, producers out there that have taken on our technologies and how they're doing that and how uh, they're able to uh, improve their bottom line using our technologies. And of course, we'll end up on uh, just how does the product go into the plant and uh, what all does Surface Tech do to support that endeavor? So with that, let's get started. So uh, as uh, we have in the past, we're gonna start off with a poll question. Uh, Phil, you can go ahead and launch that, I guess, uh, if you don't mind. And uh, as uh, in the past, we have uh, had a lot of uh, folks from around the world joining our webinars. So, uh, you know, just where are you connecting from? Uh, let's take a minute, find that on your, uh, your uh, control panel there for the GoToWebinar and, and go ahead and and uh, uh, vote, let's see here. Oh, okay, it, it, I'm not seeing it, Phil. I, I don't know if anybody else is. Yeah, it's, yep. it's, li it's live, Joe, they're voting. Okay, gotcha. All right, very good, very good. So, you know, Phil, as uh, this being our third uh, uh, time on this, you know, uh, we've had nearly I don't know, 400 attendees in total over the last six weeks. Yeah, and, or more. Uh, that's right. Yeah, it's been it's it's been a pleasure, and uh, really really thank all those uh, coming on yet again today, and and eager to learn some more. So, what are we learning here, Phil? Won't you uh, show the results of that poll? Okay, here you go, Joe. Okay. Yeah, we still have uh, folks from around the world. Uh, that's very good. Uh, very, very good. So with that, uh, Phil, why don't you close that and I'll go ahead and formally introduce you and let you take off. So um, for those that haven't uh, been on the last two, uh, Mr. Phil Blankenship, or as we affectionately call him, the Batman, uh, Blankenship Asphalt Tech and Training is that acronym. And uh, Phil is, uh, has been a consultant with us at Surface Tech since uh, 17 and uh, really started testing our product back in 16 when he was still at the Asphalt Institute. Uh, Phil brings just incredible knowledge of uh, asphalt pavement design, mix design, uh, alternative ways of coming up with better, uh, better products in the asphalt world. And we're, we're just extremely uh, thankful that he's part of our team. And with that, uh, Phil, I'm going to go ahead and give you the controls. And why don't you uh, take us uh, on to the overview of Balanced Mixed Design? Oh, very, very good. I'm Again, thank you for everybody joining today. I was looking over the, uh, I was looking over the, the list of attendees and see uh, several familiar names on there. And of course, uh, one special call out to a good friend of mine, Jason Bassano, who worked with uh, for quite some time. And Jason uh, knows more about this than uh, <laughs> than uh, uh, than, a, than a lot of folks. Uh, Jason Jason comes uh, quite experienced, and and I know we have a lot of those. When if I see Jason out there on here, I, know, I also know that we have a lot of other highly experienced folks. So 
Uh, we have every, everybody from a producer crowd today to a very technical crowd. Um, <clears throat> and as we go through this and we, we have, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. If we use some acronym you're not familiar with, please let us know that. Um, I want to, you know, a special call out to Surface Tech. Thank you guys for hosting a, as you have done and uh, going back to the first one that we did on on just uh, where we're at, uh, where we're at today and where we're moving towards when we're talking about volumetric mix design to balance mix design. I think everybody's really going to like uh, what we have coming up. I'm going to go ahead and begin to move through the uh, through the slides here. <clears throat> Uh, what we're going to be talking a, bit, a little bit about today is some of these slides that we've we've gone over before. So this is the first uh, 20 minutes here, just to really catch people up with what we've been talking about in previous webinars, and that allows Joe to take off and and show you a lot more about the constructability side of what of what happens at Surface Tech. When uh, when when I think of balanced mix design again, a lot of times we can really get our heads in the cloud and get really confused about what we're doing. <clears throat> uh, balanced mix design, again, is simply beginning to adjust uh, condition samples, and condition is a key word, or, or age samples, to look at distresses and, and such as rutting or cracking, and then take into consideration the mix aging, traffic, climate, and so on, and, and pavement structure. <clears throat> Naturally, we're doing that through a visual volumetric mix design. And then what we do is, is we add on to that, uh, we're, we're going to add on to that the, the performance testing that you see there. So you see the, the volumetric phase diagram that so many people use in design. Um, they may never look at it, but that's really what we're doing. And a little bit of a gray area there between the aggregate and the stone because the absorption that happens. And boy, we've really dotted the eye on that <clears throat> over over the, I know volumetrics was was talked about a lot in the 70s. Once we moved to to bag houses, and the reason we had to do that is because all the the bag house material that that used to just go into the air, we started bagging and and reinducing reindu or reintroducing all of that right back into the mixture. Um, when we did that, we saw this rutting issue happen, and, and in addition, we had natural sands, and and so they had to start looking at things called volumetrics to be able to balance that, to understand, you know, how to do it. Well, it makes a lot of sense that when, what really makes a big difference is the, is the dust in these mixes. And the volumetrics really give you a lot of insight to that. We're not throwing away volumetric analysis. We're just, we still need that to help us get to where we're going. But we got to add that final test on there. Uh, that would be no difference in designing the best formula for uh, rebar <clears throat> to use the right amount of calcium and the iron ore and all the chemicals that you would use to make steel but never actually test the strength of steel and how silly would that be well that's sort of what we do in the asphalt world is is we we have our types but we don't really do the final test and, and that's what we're moving for today so as we as we begin uh, going through these slides i'm going to give you a little bit about the background and the why so you know why haven't we moved to this before you may ask, well, roads um, roads don't really uh, are, are not a, a high danger like what you would with a you have with a multi-story building. And and you look at a multi-story building and with concrete and steel, there's so much wrapped around it, folks, that there's so much risk <clears throat> risk of of life. On a highway, risk of life is a uh, pothole, and and so where there's less risk. Uh, you can live with a pothole. They, we haven't put as much emphasis on testing. Until today, when you go to look at, uh, we're running out of money. And that's what brings us to this slide. When we begin understanding that our roads today have a D rating and, and 6.9 billion hours of delayed traffic in 42 hours per driver. Now, <clears throat> what that what that goes back to is that's in 2017. You're not going to see the traffic out there today, but it will come back. Uh, as we began opening up the U.S. as 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 we have started, what ha what happens is, and Joe, I'm stuck on the slide here. There we go. <clears throat> when you began to look at this, and and this is a graphic I I uh, love to update. I've been I've had this one. I have not been updating it since 1970. Uh, a good uh, person in the industry who is a uh, really brilliant guy who helped champion a lot of super pay back in the day. His name was Don Lucas. 
uh, administrator for Indiana DOT. He began showing this in the 90s, and then I, I grabbed the graphic and began updating it on my, on my own after that. And I've always found it fascinating and to, to understand the difference between our number of, number of cars, number of vehicles, which is the blue line, and then compare that to the load that you see with the red line. Even though our traffic will go up and down, the load continues to go up. And, and I've, I've told a lot of good uh, friends of mine in the design world, I said, you guys have been designing just right. You're doing great for what we have today. The problem is, is tomorrow, you're not expecting this um, seven, uh, seven to eight hundred percent increase. Most engineers are designing for you know fifteen to twenty percent increase, not seven to eight hundred over that over that period of time. Oh, I need to see if I can back up one thing. So the need that we have for balanced mix design again, as we've talked before, again it's that balance between durability and stability. And, and you can read the bullet points there, and, and I'm not gonna bore you by reading all the points. Uh, examples that I've got that I wanna share with you is, is I've been working on just designs in, in, in my lab. <clears throat> I took an old Kentucky mix design that was commonly used, and, and, and please understand, it's a good mix design that's used on a lot of, uh, of um, uh, what I call one-off roads that, that <clears throat> that you'll have uh, one to three million easels traffic, uh, equivalent single axle loads. So, you know, sort of medium traffic highways is what we would look at, or medium high traffic highways here in Kentucky. As I began to look at those mixtures, they performed well, except they, they tend to crack a little bit. Well, what they're missing is asphalt. <clears throat> so I take that very mixture, and I've been adding asphalt to it, and I found out I can add about, on a on a surface mix, it's about a 9.5 millimeter or three eighths inch mix. Uh, I'm, I can add about another uh, five tenths asphalt to it and it will, it can actually bear it. Now what happens as I, <clears throat> as anybody would find out quickly, you begin to, <clears throat> as I add that asphalt, I've got to do something with it and, and it's going to lower my voids. Um, you got to work with the DOT to understand our, when they talk about balanced mix design, are they going to lock you in at 4% air voids? Or are they going to say, we're going to allow the air voids to be somewhere between 3 and 4%, for instance. I don't mind the design down to 2%, but I know not everybody is, uh, has that risk profile. And, and if I'm designing that low, I'm going to make sure I don't have any natural sand in it. Natural sand <clears throat> can really bite you as you go lower air voids. But natural sand can actually aid in compaction <clears throat> when used properly. So in the mix I'm using, it probably has about 8% natural sand in it. What I found out is when I added the asphalt, um, it, it, uh, it does rut more. But guess what? This is, rutting is not an issue. And as long as I know where that, that is, and you, somebody may say, oh, my goodness, it only has 8,000 passes in a Hamburg test. I'm okay with that because this is not for an interstate level highway. This is for a... Um, this is for a, uh, a secondary type highway. The cracking though went from uh, in the in the in the low uh, 90s, maybe pushing into the uh, 200 level, and so that gives you an idea of what I'm doing for balanced mix design. Now the question is, I may look at that and I feel good about balanced mix design. It's like this is great, but if I'm testing for the wrong climate and I lower that temperature, back down I go again, and there's only so much I can do with asphalt and air voids. And that's what a lot of that we're going to be talking about today where the aramid fiber comes in to help you enhance that mixture way beyond uh, way beyond what you could do with just with uh, just asphalt and aggregate. <clears throat> just to re recap, uh, cracking is prevalent through the United States. And I'm sure if we were to, to check with our friends in Canada and feel free to chat, uh, folks has joined us from there, those from the Middle East, other countries, uh, let us know what some of those distresses are. But I'm willing to bet cracking is, is, is prevalent unless you're in these uh, areas where you do not have good aggregate and you just have hot climate all day long. <clears throat> Limitations, again, just recapping, is we're, we're designing heavily upon air voids in terms such as VMA. We're trying to use a look at the effective binder 
which that's the effective binder is what's left over after the initial binder is absorbed into the aggregate. There's no way in volumetrics I can understand positive or negative effects of polyphosphoric acid, uh, reclaimed engine oil bottoms or, or vacuum tower extenders, VTEs they call them, rejuvenators or, or bio oils or um, any of these type of products that, that, would be, that would be put in today. I can't even understand RAP and RAS performance I can understand how they affect my volumetrics, but I have no idea how they would affect the performance. So without performance testing, <clears throat> I have a choice. I can read a lot of literature <clears throat> and make some estimates, or I can put it in and guess and wait for about five to 10 years to see what happens. And that's sort of what we've done. And, and we've waited and we don't necessarily like the results of the balance of materials that we have. Thus performance testing allows us to do that quicker. Binder quality has changed. Binder plays an important role, as you know, in the performance. Uh, <clears throat> binder, <laughs> in its liquid form, is a lubricant. Wow, you never really thought about that, but let me see. Let me heat that roadway up, and what do I have between the rocks? I have oil, and, and that is not a desirable uh, product to have but if I take that binder and I get the correct stiff grade and it stiffens, now it moves from being a lubricant or an oil to a, uh, to a sticky resin type material that now will bind my uh, structure together. Now, if I cool it all the way down, now I've got to be careful because they, they, the term they this use called a glassy transition temperature. Now my product can become brittle. So I've got to pay attention to all of these different things uh, and, and understand the asphalt grades. A lot of materials working together. So again, it goes beyond analyzing the volumetrics and helps us estimate that performance. The tests that are available today, if I'm talking to contractors, just depends where I'm at. If I'm in Kentucky, a lot of folks are using Ideal CT uh, toward the south. If I'm in Illinois, they're using a thing called the SCB. I fit the SCB is one that's pictured there in the center. The Ideal CT is in the top right. Some of you say, Hey, that looks like a TSR. Uh, bingo, you're correct. It's a it's a 62 millimeter sample, not a 95. Uh, this shape compact tension test, not pictured. Uh, that's what you're going to see used by the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, or Minnesota. Uh, they like that test because it does a lot better at helping them when they get really cold temperatures. If I try to test really soft binders at 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 cold temperatures and I can't get it cold enough. Uh, these tests where you, such as SCB or Ideal CT, you could actually have a problem where you're bending the sample and not really breaking it. Overlay tests are not pictured. Uh, a four-point bending beam fatigue, SVECD, there's all sorts of things that we can, we can use. On the rutting side, uh, the one pictured that's not pictured here is one we're seeing out in, um, in, in the West. I think Vegas likes to use it. It's a, it's a pine, uh, pine wheel test. And, and there's many, many other uh, rutting type tests that we can use. But just the, the key ones that we hear so much about is the Hamburg. We are, and that's pictured on the left and on the right, you actually see an APA. Now that's called an APA Junior. The APA Junior can not only run the APA test with the rubber hose, but you can swap it out and, and run, a, uh, run the test with, with a steel wheel. Uh, note, I believe both of these machines can run the test wet or dry. Now, why is that important? Well, if I'm running them wet, I can also pick up a stripping component. But sometimes if stripping is not an issue and I'm just want to look at running, maybe I want to isolate one of the variables. Maybe, maybe I want to do a thing called a flow number test. Now, that's a more elaborate test, and, uh, but that's a very important one, too, that gives me a more fundamental of the running to where I'm pulsing a sample and letting it relax. No different than a semi or, or a large truck running over an interstate pavement or a, a high capacity pavement. And, it, and as it goes over that pavement, the pavement will take a pulse and then it relaxes. And that test does very well at, at the flow number test is not just a, an index test, but the flow number test can actually give you a number where you multiply the cycles into a formula. You can, you can pretty much predict and what it's designed to do is predict 
half inch rutting over a certain number of, uh, of vehicles. So again, flow number is, is a lot more science uh, built in with it versus just one of these index or rutting tests. But if I'm a contractor, I may not be interested in, in the complexity. I just need something simple and quick. And that's where as a producer, these, these rutting tests work very well that you see in the picture. Again, rutting and cracking and, and right now, what, <clears throat> what we seem to have is, is again, cracking is a, is a number one uh, and, and rutting uh, we rarely, rarely see. Now I have heard as we move towards balanced mix design, I've heard rutting uh, creeping its head back up. So again, uh, can we actually design a mixture without swinging that pendulum back and forth or on this one, um, a seesaw back and forth between cracking and rutting? Absolutely. But we got to think outside the box of just trying to do things with asphalt and aggregate. Again, that's where these modifiers come in and a, and a product like you're seeing today, <clears throat> ASEXP, Aramid Fiber is one of those type of products because it a, it's a polymer fiber and, and I've been out on enough jobs and I'm not talking about just construction, looking at jobs that are four and five years old and you begin to realize there's things that products like this that they, they have such good performance, we as engineers will struggle to try to capture how they work in the laboratory. So that's where the challenge comes in with those who are the testing engineers. Uh, what I'd like to do is encourage you all to have your eyes open on new products, whether it's an aramid fiber or whatever is introduced, to realize the testing that you run may not always pick up on, on these ad advances in materials because a lot of these tests that we have are simply designed to pick up on the basics of of asphalt and aggregate. It even struggles sometimes to pick up uh, the differences in, in what polymer can do for you. Again, we talk about uh, these index tests and I'm, and I'm picturing these again. Uh, the, the one on the left is a Hamburg test, the one on the right being what they call an auto SCB, uh, which is more than just an SCB test. Uh, it, is, it, is also, <clears throat> it, it is also a a test that you could run ideal CT or other fixtures in it. <clears throat> it's sort of a small frame uh, universal tester. If I'm a contractor and, and, and I'm looking at this saying, I want to get into this type of testing, <clears throat> what am I going to buy? Well, I'm probably going to buy the one on the right first because if I have a cracking issue and I can purchase this device on the right, maybe what I'm doing is, <clears throat> is I'm buying one brand that may be uh, no matter which brand, you're probably at a price point between seven to ten thousand dollars, would be my bet, and that gets you in on this type of testing very, very quickly. No cutting, no trimming. Then the next thing I'm going to have to have is I, I is I'm, I'm going to either find somebody who has the device on the left called a Hamburg wheel tracker or an APA. I'm going to find a buddy who will let me do it or a laboratory, and, uh, and and by the way, I would love, my little plug here, Steve and Joe, <laughs> I would love to be your laboratory, but you'll find a laboratory who can do that for you, <clears throat> or you go and purchase one. Now that is that that device there is a lot more than $10,000, but it's also a lot larger. Uh, and, and so it's, and these are not even uh, true to scale uh, as I have a picture here, but the device on the left is, is quite large and, it is uh, very elaborate <clears throat> in what it's able to do. But it now gives me, without having those two devices, and there's so many other tests I'd like to run, but by having those two devices, I have a pretty good idea of the predictive capability of what my mixture, at least an indicator of what it's gonna do out in the field versus blindly going into it as maybe I have in years before. Remember I talked about that mixture that I worked with, uh, a common mixture that I work with as a lab standard is this very mixture here that you're seeing. And, and <clears throat> while I was only using uh, things such as beam fatigue and, and, um, uh, and APA at the time, and this one was done when I was back at Asphalt Institute, uh, this common mix that you see here was able to take uh, an additional half percent asphalt before it even began to move. And that is a, uh, this is in its very basic, very basic definition is what we talk about in a balanced mix design is to check these points. So if you want to look at balanced mix design, one way you could plot it is this plot here. I'm going to show you another one in a moment. That's another way to plot it. 
<clears throat> but in this case, I may have a cracking test on one side, as you see cycles to failure on one side, and on the opposite side, on the right, you see this rutting. <clears throat> so I'm gonna have my cracking and rutting, and then on the bottom, I may simply have asphalt content. Now, be careful, because it's not just about asphalt content. There's so many other variables, and a lot of people say, well, balanced mix design is just adding asphalt. It's a lot more than that, because what you may have to do is restructure your mixture to handle more asphalt. You may have to open up your mixture, or maybe it's too open, but instead of filling it with dust, uh, you may have to collapse a little bit of the middle. Um, so again, it just depends on your aggregate structure and, and what you're looking at. For instance, <clears throat> in Kentucky, I struggle to keep dust out of the mixture because of my limestone that breaks down. Whereas I may go to the Southeast or Northeast, and I may have a very clean, um, uh, hard aggregate such as granite. And, and now um, I may struggle to even get enough dust in my mixture. So just to give you an idea, it's gonna be different for everybody because we're talking about materials that are mined out of the, out of the ground and crushed. And, and now we're blending those materials with a locally available uh, asphalt that could be from a Canadian crude, Alaskan crude, it could be from a, um, a, a Southwest crude source, it could be from a Gulf Coast crude source, and we're really uh, putting our thinking caps on here and begin to blend these together. And it's really hard to wrap your head around all the things that are going on. And what I like to say there is, where do you start? Well, you start at the beginning. Put something together, get a rut number on it, get a crack number on it, and start at the beginning and, and chart your way through this and just make notes. And because uh, we all are scientists, we just got to figure out uh, where to start sometimes. This is the more complex version. This one gets me a little dizzy. But all I have there on the left, if you look, is what I'm looking at on the left is my st stability and durability curve. Stability is rutting resistance. If you look at that top left curve, as I add asphalt to the bottom, my stability goes over and it's like those roller coasters you ride and it takes just a very quick dive to the bottom. Uh, that's rutting, and if you add too much asphalt, it will do that. Well, I could also, on the bottom, I could call that natural. Instead of asphalt content, and this is what I'm talking about. It's not just natural asphalt content. It may be, maybe I've added more natural sand. Maybe I've added more dust. Maybe I've added more of a, of a rounded or a, uh, a partially crushed, crushed aggregate. There's so many things I could have on the bottom that change that stability curve. Then on the on the left, um, on the left, what I'm looking at, left bottom, I'm looking at a durability curve. And what you see there is going up the hill. As I add asphalt, uh, I would climb. Now, what happens if I add natural sand? Well, that may not help me with durability, but if I trade dust for asphalt, now I'm adding durability. So again, not just pure asphalt content. Another way I can improve durability is change my air voids and make it, make it more, uh, more dense. Just a very quick overview, um, ideal CT background, again, performing it at room temperature. And if I'm a contractor, the very first thing I'm gonna do is probably get this test and try to run it or a similar test to it. Notice they're compacted to 62 millimeters. Why in the world do we choose 62? Uh, because they're, they're rounding it from, a, from an English unit. I wish we would have just called it 60 or 65, but no, we went with 62. That's okay, we can, we can live with it and make it work. In having a 62 millimeter sample, the importance of that is that's also the same height that you would use for a half inch mix or a three eighths or those who are in the metric side, the 12.5 or 12 to a uh, to a nine millimeter mixture. And and that is the same height that I would use in a Hamburg test, too. So that way you're making the same height sample. So that's why they went with a, an ideal CT of 62. It's the same height as a as a Hamburg sample. Just the basic curve, and, and I love to show this, as you, as you begin to take that green line and, and move it to the top, you see a crack begin to form. And by the time you get to point four, you see that crack going right down through the middle and then expanding more. So two things are happening in this test, and we call it crack initiation. And in this one, I'm not saw cutting anything. I'm, I'm simply allowing the crack to form itself. Uh, it can be a little bit more error, but the, the simplicity out, the simplicity and the need for simplicity outweighs um, 
outweighs what you're doing there. And by the way, if you want to reduce error, simply run more tests. If you're having issues with, with three or four, run five or six. And then you can use an ASTM uh, standard, an E standard to, to throw out an outlier. And that helps you reduce your error. And there's other ways to do that too. Again, that's just things that we specialize in on, on reducing error and uh, not to be uh, not to go into the, all that today. But if I see that crack beginning to form, uh, now I've got a concern. So let me give you an example. Let me use aramid fiber, for instance. Aramid fiber will help me uh, help maybe a little bit make that curve where you see one, two, three go up. It may raise that curve just a little bit because everybody's thinking, wow, the fiber is really going to help you peak and really help your tensile strength. Not necessarily. It's a polymer fiber, so it's going to give uh, with the mixture where the aramid fiber really makes the big difference is in the back side of that curve from three to four to five. And that's where that curve, instead of being very steep, it would actually begin to flatten and extend out further. That's important to note because what's the aramid fiber doing? It's helping to glue your sample together. So, so instead of just looking at these tests, I've just ran a number and I get a number, try to understand what's going on with the test because then you may say, wow, I could also extend that curve and make it look better if I used a sulfur binder or if I used a polymer asphalt or I did different. You're right, you can. But then you got to watch your stability side too on the rutting. But anyway, try to understand what it's doing. And again, there's a lot of focus on, uh, and I hate to use the term flattening the curve, but um, uh, in lack of terms, we're trying to get a flatter slope from three to four to five. And that's how you get a higher ideal CT value. I'm going to move on past this one. And again, what we're doing here um, very simply on this is we're loading a sample at 50 millimeters a minute, or that's, that's, um, that's two inches a, a minute. It's a straight, what they call line load displacement. In other words, we're pushing it right down the middle of the sample, measuring it and from there. We're not actually having anything on the sample measuring anything there. It's just a, it's a direct load on the sample. We calculate that CT index from the data recorded. So you're taking the area underneath that curve that's back here. You take the area underneath the curve and you're dividing it by that, by that slope. Remember I mentioned that slope on the back end is really important. So if I'm a contractor, I'm probably going to go out and buy one of these two units here on the left. Um, I'm, I'm guessing uh, others such maybe as Humboldt, maybe making something now. I know uh, trucks, always check with your all your companies. You've got uh, Instratech, you've got Pine, HMA Lab Supply. You have, uh, uh, again, I mentioned Troxler. You've got Humboldt, uh, Gilson, so many test, temp, test companies out there. And if you're not, uh, have relationships with these, call those guys up and talk to them. They're more than willing not just to sell you something, but, but to help you out through the process. I want to show you just very quickly about how that uh, if I'm if I'm doing this in the laboratory, thank you, Joe, for starting it. Mixing things in the laboratory is um, is very important. And this gives you just a quick in, you know, a quick idea. Uh, some people have asked, and I'm switching gears just a little bit here, but how in the world can I add fiber uh, in the laboratory? And this is just a demonstration here of Zach, who works at the Bat Lab. Now he's weighing the, the fibers in that you see going on here. And you notice we have a, a precision scale. He's then going to break the fibers up uh, before we, we put them uh, into the mixture. And it's really important to get these broken up, as you're seeing here. Now, normally, if you're working with the fiber at the plant level, it's going to have a wax coating. I am not working with the wax coating here because it... it it's easier to add at the plant than it is uh, in the laboratory. So at the laboratory, I like to work with what we call a, a naked fiber. I think I can say that on the air. Um, so as I'm uh, as we're putting this in here, Zach has added the uh, the aggregate. He's now dosing it with the wrap that you see that's going in. That wrap is actually heated, and then he's adding the asphalt binder. Now some of you are saying, where are the fiber? Well, we're going to show you where the fibers go in here in just a moment. Those fibers he has pulled apart, by the way, and they're really separated. All of these detailed procedures, and that's what I like to use this to show you, all of these detailed procedures and going over and over and over with these type of things is really important to reduce that error. And so what you saw Zach doing there 
is, is now, uh, he's added the components. Now he's beginning to blend them together. And, and now my mixture is coated typically after about a minute. We let it continue to move. And now we're gonna add the aramid fiber. If I'm doing it this, at the plant, Joe will show you here in just a, a moment uh, how that works at the plant or, or I guess in the, maybe in the next hour and how we, how we do it at a, at a plant level and how all that works. But um, as, we, as we said before, at the plant level, it's being added at the wrap collar. Uh, here, we're, we're again trying to simulate in the laboratory. We continue to mix the fiber in and it's that easy. Somebody may say, well, hey, um, could I take mixture from the field and that I've gathered and add and, and heat it back up and add fiber to it? Absolutely, you can. Uh, you know, run you a control and do the same with it and then check it with your fiber and you'll see the benefits. This is an ideal CT test. So now that I made my sample, uh, I've let it cool, I've conditioned it in water, I put it in an ideal CT test and that test is qu as quick as what you're seeing there. After, after um, you know, uh, 20, 20 seconds or so, uh, you'll be done with that sample and then you'll have a number and you pick up another one and you run it. Okay, um, <clears throat> so again, if, if I'm looking at how do I design a mixture to be rut resistant or crack resistant, I'm just gonna go through a few things here. It's important to realize all those things I've talked about before, and now I'm gonna add on the wrap and RAS on top of that. <clears throat> Look what wrap will do. And why does it do that? Well, not all the asphalt comes off. So not only can we be asphalt deficient, but also we're dealing with a, with a material uh, it's not uncommon for a surface wrap. If it started, uh, and I'm going to use a Kentucky grade here, if it started with maybe a PG6422, by the time I mill it off, that very well could be a PG82-16 uh, or an 88 minus 10. It can stiffen that much just depending upon how, how long it's out there. And that's typically with about an inch, inch and a half material. If I lower my wrap, but now I add RAS, which is even uh, RAS is recycled asphalt shingles or reclaimed asphalt shingles, <clears throat> even a stiffer material, shingles are made to be stiff so they don't slide off your roof. And now that makes my ideal CT go down, <clears throat> down quite a bit. And of course, this work was done by Fuji and he did a lot of other tests. But something that's important to bring out here is you look at this and you go, wow, you know, knowing that uh, I can't use wrap or RAS. I would tell you that's not the case because you're going to see here in just a moment of how we can do different things uh, with with uh, asphalt and blending of asphalt and and adding aramid fiber to bring those values back up. <clears throat> the next one that's really important that I like to show this, and I'm not going into the great detail on this, but um, this is just a graph that emphasizes the importance of the ideal CT test and on the left side is actual cracking. On the right side is, is laboratory cracking. If you notice, there's more cracking on the wrap RAS mixture. If I look on the ideal CT test on the right, if I look say on the left, go back to the left, on the wrap and RAS mix, the burgundy line, you see the cracking in the field is way up there. And if I go to the graph on the right, the wrap and RAS mix has one of the lowest ideal CT. That's only, that is only a data point. We can give slides like this to you over and over and over. This is a very good test, and that's why the industry is moving forward with, with this test and other tests. <clears throat> um, another piece that we did here uh, at the Bat Lab uh, for, the, for the guys with Surface Tech is we began uh, looking at um, a single dose and a double dose. And, and actually, this was, uh, this was actually field mix that was brought in where we began to look at it. And, and test after test, we continue to see this. You look at the, if you'd have had a control in here, the control would have probably been down near a 50. And now I add the ace aramid fiber and I, I go up near a 90. And now I double dose it and I take that value on up uh, to 125. Whatever you put the aramid fiber in, it's gonna make it better. Uh, you've gotta look at the economics and Joe's not afraid to share those and he's gonna go over those with you. And, and Surface Tech has a, has a good uh, calculator up on their website to help you with this. But understand your economics, but realize this is how you make mixes better. It's important to realize on the right, uh, hey, I'll just go with the 7022 because it will absolutely perform better. Well, keep in mind, it's a little stiffer um, and, and you, didn't, you didn't change your low end grade. You just changed your upper grade from a PG64 to a 70. 
So my ideal CT goes down a little bit, but notice what happens when I double dose it. Uh, that has a little bit of a, a 7022 can have a little bit of polymer in, and now you get this synergy happening uh, with the aramid fiber and look what it goes up to, um, over, over 200 CT index. So again, that's why it's important to have these tests in there. A uh, quick overview of the Hamburg, and I mean very quick. Again, we've looked at these two devices, uh, the one on your left, one on your right. Both of them are capable of, of the, even though the one on the right is called an APA Junior, they both can run the Hamburg test. They both can run it wet. They both can run it dry. Uh, you're putting a similar load. They both have the same steel wheels. Uh, just depends on your flavor of, of brand and, and, uh, and, and working with these guys, both, uh, both companies are outstanding that, that, that makes these devices and a special call out to, to these companies for uh, uh, their devices that they've delivered in the industry today. And again, one that's not pictured up here is of course Troxler and Troxler makes a very good uh, wheel tracker too. And there's others out there, Cooper and, and Controls and other companies. But again, these are the two I'm putting up on here because these are the ones I'm most familiar with in the area that I work in today. Ashto T324, I would love to do a dramatic reading of that, Joe, but I'm gonna bypass on the uh, dramatic reading of Ashto T324 standard. I'd refer people to that. While it's typically tested at 50, I would encourage you, if you're in the South and you're looking at intersections, be looking at numbers like 55 to test. If you're in the, uh, as you get up North, uh, if you're in the Northern US, you need to be at, at 45C or cooler. If you're getting up in Canada and even further north, I would encourage you to be looking at, at test temperatures of 40 C. And, th and that way you get reliable results out of it and can match it with your climate. I'm gonna skip past the procedure, Joe. Um, and uh, again, this test, uh, it, it will go through and condition for about an hour but what we're really after is it, it'll take the test, uh, depends upon how quick it fails, but let's say up to six hours to run or so. And data is recorded and reported as an average passes because it's, it's actually getting a wheel profile and you can choose you know, which, uh, which, which points you wanna pull off, but <laughs> they're typically pulling off the, the middle points. And then we can calculate the stripping inflection point Again, it can be a little subjective, but if my curve starts to decay very rapidly, it's an indicator I may not be having just a rutting problem. I could have a stripping uh, issue where my silica sands or whatever it may be, may be uh, debonding from my asphalt. And you'll see your water go from a clear condition or a murky condition to a, to a very dark, dirty condition. And that is an indicator of those fines coming out of your mixture. Typically, you won't see it blow out your big rocks too quickly, but boy, you'll see it blow out the fine stuff very quickly. I'm gonna to try to move on. Um, there's that graph of the stripping inflection point, um, typical Hamburg graph. And if there's any questions on that, please ask. We can come back to it. Um, there's, a, there's a new way, a thing I wanted to show you. I'm just gonna go straight to the next slide. And I wanna talk about this. It's a, it's a rutting resistance index. And actually a good friend of mine, Jason Bassano had uh, pointed this out to me. It was work that came from uh, the, the paper that you see down there, Journal of TRB in 2016. And the reason this was important was that if I have a sample that runs 20,000 passes and ruts, let's say a half inch or 12 millimeters, and then I have another one that ruts maybe um, a quarter inch or um, six millimeters. They both look the same. By, by taking the cycles times one minus the rut depth, and, and for us that's in inches, for those joining us from Canada, feel free to adjust this formula. I can, I can appreciate the pain in trying to go back and forth between metric and imperial units. Use this formula and you can do stuff like I'm gonna show you on this next graph. In this case, on the bottom, I've got a rutting resistance index. So let me explain this. 20,000 passes time a, times a half inch, 20 times a half, 20 times 0.5 gives me 10,000. That's the number I'm starting with. So I wanna be to there or to the right to make it better. If I'm looking at my average CT index, 
what I want to do is the number that's been thrown out a lot is I want to be at roughly about 100 or better. And so we've created this box that you see here around the sample. And so this is the box that I want to be in. Now, remember we talked about balanced mix design and stability and one way to plot it. And I said, there's going to be another way to look at it. This is another way you can look at it. Instead of plotting all those curves versus asphalt content, I've just got one plot here and I want to be in the box. I don't necessarily have to be really high in the box. I just need to be in the box. I don't want to be out of the box. So remember the 6422 we talked about before with a single dose? There it is. What about the 7022 with a single dose? There it is. It's the green dot. The blue dot represents the 6422 with a double dose of aramid fiber or the ASEXP aramid polymer fiber or of the red one, if I really want to soup it up, uh, now I've got something that is really crack resistant. Maybe, maybe you've got a client that says, I want the best crack resistant mixture that you can put down. Okay, so you have to say then, what's the difference in the cost of going from the 6422 to the 7022, uh, which has the same amount of uh, aramid fiber in it? Well, if it's, um, if it's another 10%, you have to ask yourself, is it worth it to go from this value on up and uh, to go up to uh, from a from 120 CT index, roughly up to uh, over the 200 value. So that gives you an idea. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next slide. And I think we're about done here, Joe. There you go. Hey. Joe, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and I'm gonna take over on the questions and I'll run this poll and uh, Thank you guys at Surface Tech for allowing me to go through that and, and take it away, Joe. Thanks, Phil, appreciate it. Um, it's great to have you here as always. So we're gonna kind of get our thinking caps on and, and uh, switch from uh, complete testing. If everyone to would please go ahead and, uh, and, and uh, check out this poll that we have here. Hopefully everybody's able to vote on that one. Why is aramid polymer fiber a perfect choice for asphalt producers? If you would go ahead and fill that out. Joe, I'm gonna mute. If you wanna unmute and take it from here, go right ahead. Okay, thanks, Phil. Can you hear me? Phil? Joe, if you can hear me, we cannot hear you. So you keep talking, Joe, and when we can hear you, I'll let you know. Until then, I will just continue on with the webinar. So if everybody would just go ahead and, and vote. Looks like we have about 54% um, of the votes in right now. I'll let you keep on voting. I'll leave it open here for about another 20, 30 seconds. Bill, can you hear me now? I can hear you, Joe. You can, okay, yeah. great. Thanks, appreciate that. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look hey, at that. Hey, Joe. Yeah, go ahead, Phil. My, 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 I'm glad somebody posted. Michael Simmons said that my audio just kicked back on. I have no idea what's going on, but the good news is it's working now. I hear you. Sorry, folks, for the confusion. Probably over talking Joe a lot. So take it away, now, Joe. Can you hear me now, Phil? I think got, everybody else can. Okay, so uh, so kicking it back to let's uh, bring the synergies of testing back to the product, and uh, you know one of the things that. Uh, uh, really is good for uh, our, the use of our product is that it puts the control back in the producer's hands. And so as you go through this, uh, it looks like everybody kind of got the answer right. It's all of the above. So it is a plant added product. It can be turned off at any time, on and off at any time. It can replace uh, terminal blended uh, polymer modification in the binder. And it does not change the production or lay down procedure. So congratulations to all those that got that. Let's move on. We're gonna shift gears a little bit here to start out today's agenda. We're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, one of the reasons we're all sitting here on this webinar is, is COVID-19. Uh, maybe what we haven't thought about is what's the next steps? We're all kind of pinned up. Uh, we're not going anywhere. We're not flying. Uh, we're not driving any great distances. Now we're into kind of the, the beginning of summer. We're really not using any heating oil. Now, I bet a lot of us haven't thought about what does that really mean? Hey, when I have gotten to the, the gas station, gas is really cheap. 
and it is, and uh, it, it, it's all for that reason, and that's the fact that we're not consuming the fuel that we normally do, uh, nor was it predicted, obviously, uh, and so from the standpoint of what's going on in the world, well, we're really not uh, using up our reserves. We're, we've got overcapacity of all of the, what I'll call top of the barrel fuels. So what does that mean? Well, oil production, we've seen that in the news, uh, you know, really was a bad time for overproduction in the beginning of this whole COVID thing. Looks like it's kind of uh, evened out now, slumping to match demand. Um, but the refineries are sitting on a huge amount of inventories of this uh, top of the barrel fuels, which has driven down the prices in the marketplace. Um, now, they've got no more capacity. They, they, you know, they don't have a lot of room to continue to refine and store that material. So what have they done? They have slowed uh, production down of the top of the barrel fuels. And on top of all of this, um, it's being estimated, uh, this stat here is actually from California, that the gas tax collection by states might be as off as much as 75%. So you're looking at, okay, we're going to maybe uh, have a shortage coming up and we're also not bringing in the tax dollars that we were expecting. What in the world does that all mean? Well, think of it this way. Once the world gets back to doing what we do, we're going to very quickly start using up all of the reserves. And you got to remember that asphalt binder, as you look at uh, the, the graphic on the right hand side, is really the bottom of the barrel product. It's a byproduct. It is not made unless we are making the top of the barrel product. And so right now there is uh, some capacity, or, or if you will, there are uh, uh, reserves of, of what we call our liquid binder, but they're very quickly going to get used up. And the question becomes, can the refineries then catch up to our needs in the paving world? Um, history has, has told us uh, back in, uh, at 9-11 and also the, uh, the the collapse, if you will, of the economy in 2007 and 8, both of those were indicators that we didn't do a very good job of catching back up very quickly. Asphalt prices went through the roof. Um, availability got scarce. Polymer modification got very expensive. We're going to see the same thing again, and it's coming. Uh, the question is when and how bad will it get? Um, and then on top of all of this, we don't have the tax revenue being generated by us driving our cars every day and collecting that, that gas tax revenue. So our, uh, our partners out there at the DOT cities and counties, they're going to be facing potential budget cuts, results of, um, you know, these price increases that are going to come and less tax revenue. You know, most DOTs, uh, you know, have a, an index for paying for the for the asphalt. Well, that's fine and dandy, uh, but the problem becomes if the asphalt prices double and triple, there's not going to be the money uh, or you're going to be, you know, losing your budgets. Uh, every project's going to come in over budget. You're not going to have the same amount of ability to put uh, projects down as you had originally anticipated. So this is a this is going to be an issue and uh, if history has told us anything, those kind of situations in the past has created, uh, you know, innovation partners in the in the in the marketplace, and this is where owner agencies, producers, pavers, and industry leaders like ourselves or uh, uh, the state asphalt associations, Napa, we all kind of put our heads together and say, what can we do? Um, there is talk that we're eventually one of these days we're going to pass stimulus for. Uh, the construction industry as a whole, that's good. But at the same time, if our asphalt is costing, you know, 50% more, you know, we're, we're still costing ourselves the ability to repair our roadways effectively. So we really need to have an out of the box thinking uh, to, to keep the cost of our asphalt pavements as low as possible. And um, this, again, will bring uh, all of us together in the industry to try to come up with some, some short-term solutions uh, to help keep us uh, all paving and, and keep the tons of asphalt being produced by our producers 
uh, and not fall short of what their expectations are. So here at, at Surface Tech, we, we really have three innovations that fall into this category and how we can uh, help everybody in the industry. And uh, you see there at the top, I, I, I state it very clearly, use more wrap. Uh, history has shown us that uh, in times like this, we have. Uh, we, history has also shown us that when we have done that, um, there has been some uh, quality issues, uh, long-term quality issues with the pavement. We're gonna address that here in a little bit. Uh, use Ace XP polymer fiber in lieu of polymer modification. That's another great uh, tool and opportunity to help keep that cost down without sacrificing uh, the expected uh, performance of the pavement. And then, uh, you know, another thing that can be done, again, where we're looking for tonnage to go through our asphalt plant. So, you know, let's look at those uh, geo inner layers uh, that are out there, paving grids, paving fabrics, and switch them over to a technology that allows for an asphalt inner layer to go down. So these innovations will help offset high binder costs. And this is what we're going to talk about for the rest of today. Now, to get to use those tools, we have to pull from what Phil was talking about earlier. We got to have some performance testing. We got to be thinking about balanced mix design. We don't want to give up performance. In fact, we, we should be expecting of ourselves to try to improve performance at the same time. And, and we've got the tools out there to do that now with, again, the ideal CT and the Hamburg uh, uh, tests that will be great indicators of uh, future performance of our roadways. Um, but there's some other things in that toolbox. Phil's already talked about, yeah, can we add a little bit of liquid binder? Well, if the cost of liquid binder is going up, that may not be what we want to do. But you can, and you can improve maybe the cracking resistance of your, of your product. He also talked about lowering air voids, removing dust, you know, adding wrap or RAS. Can we do that? Can we remove it? These are easy things that can be done. And then you got to look at the plant delivered additives. You know, we specifically are thinking about Ace XP polymer fibers, but there's other things that that can be combined with these liquid binder modifiers that are out there, the bio oils. What we're seeing is the combination of the aramid fiber with those binder, uh, with those uh, bio oils is giving us some incredible results. So, and then, we kind of wrap all of this up into what we call Surface Tech's Good, Better, Best and Test Program, where we're gonna get into the lab and we're gonna do some of this testing and see how the product, uh, the, out, uh, uh, the, the, the product itself, the asphalt, uh, performs as we make these tweaks to the mix design. So the program is really designated to create the engineering data to understand the current mix design performance and then to achieve improved performance through the performance testing using the additives as we're talking about, specifically Ace XP polymer fiber. You know, and then the second part of this is once you have that performance data, both on cracking and rutting, to marry that solution uh, to the problem that's in the field. The same solution doesn't necessarily fix all problems. Some are worse than others. You should have the ability to pick and choose or apply the right solution to the given problem because at the end of the day, if you're over designing, you're also overspending. The best engineered solution is the one that delivers the expected performance at the lowest cost. So in general, and you're gonna see through the, the slide bank here today, um, we call our single dose of Ace XP polymer fiber a very good solution. You're gonna see, um, you know, improvement in crack performance and rub performance 30 to 50%. Once you start getting into, Phil mentioned it earlier, the double dose or 8.4 ounces of Ace XP, you're going to see incredible results over, as you already did on one of the slides, even over and beyond 30 to 50%, okay? And then, you know, if you really want the best uh, solution out there, you'd start looking at an asphalt uh, inner layer product, and that would be our, our army product in which uh, the, the, the aramid that's being used in that varies uh, depending on where we are in the country and the performance results that uh, are expected by the specifier and owner. So again, we believe through this process, these innovative ideas can come to light 
and be used more readily available here in the near future as we're looking to stretch our dollars with the increased cost in our binder uh, costs moving forward. So um, what is ASEXP polymer fiber? You've heard us uh, talk about it a little bit, just a, again, a, a quick overview. We've talked about it the last two webinars, but it is uh, a, a polymer fiber that is proven technology that increases the strength, crack resistance, rut resistance, fatigue life, toughness, and service life of any asphalt concrete product. That uh, is a mouthful, but uh, you'll see here both for, from field performance and also the ideal CT and Hamburg testing that we continuously do, uh, we can uh, make these claims because it is uh, real. The product itself is actually the combination of two products. Uh, we call uh, aramid fiber the active ingredient. We called sassabit wax the inactive ingredient. Um, the inactive ingredient is simply there to weigh down the very lightweight fibers and get them into the mixing drum and past uh, uh, the stream going to the bag house. We do not want to get it those lightweight uh, fibers into the bag house. We want to get it into the mix. So this has been engineered to uh, deliver the lightweight uh, uh, fibers in a bundle form with the coating of, of, of wax. The product itself is a 50-50 blend between aramid and sassabit, whether you're using a single dose or a double dose, single dose of 4.2, double dose of 8.4. That wax melts at about 170 degrees F, and uh, at the point where it's going in at the wrap collar, you're probably in that uh, 300 to 330 range. So as soon as it hits that hot stream, it starts to uh, 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 me uh, melt and then release all those uh, aramid fibers into uh, the aggregate and uh, and wrap and get it mixed in the in the dry section of the drum. So the nice thing about it again, it's a plant added uh, additive. Uh, the lengths of those fibers are an inch and a half long. There's about 12,000 of those per bundle. That gives you about 10 million of those fibers for every ton of liquid as or every ton of uh, asphalt uh, produced. Um, the wax itself does become fully soluble in the liquid binder, meaning you won't see it as a byproduct in the mix, okay? Uh, a couple other real important points. There's no change in mix design or laid down procedures. So no change to the JMF. You do not have to go in and do what we are talking about with the, the whole design side. If you just wanna add it, you can. If you wanna get in and try to improve your, your mix design, then you can do that as well. But that mix design won't be changed by the amount of aramid you put in. The mix design will be changed based on the performance testing done on the mix design uh, to, to see that benefit. No extra liquid binder necessary. You do not have to add li extra liquid binder. It, our fiber does not absorb, okay? So um, whatever you're using, you can add that in uh, to that existing, add the ACE right into that existing uh, mix design. High strength, high tensile strength, 400,000 PSI, and probably uh, as much as all of that, a very, very high melt temperature. So it makes it compatible with uh, the asphalt production uh, temperatures. The two largest producers in the world of aramid fiber is Tejin, and their product uh, brand name is Tuaron and DuPont, and most of us know what Kevlar is. So uh, been around since 1960, uh, uh, Tejin out of, is a Danish company. They're they're actually the largest producer in the world. They they own about 50% in total of the of the total aramid market across the world. Uh, we can do business with both companies. Currently, we are using uh, Tejin's product as uh, our active ingredient. I mentioned earlier, you know, what makes it so suitable for asphalt reinforcement? A, it's the high tensile strength and B, it's the heat capacity with our manufacturing process. So as you can see here, this man-made fiber has been used for a whole lot of high performance kind of applications. Anywhere where there was steel reinforcement, uh, you know, lightweight steel reinforcement in the past, it's kind of getting converted over to aramid, not just in the asphalt industry, but in all of these kind of industries worldwide, including uh, uh, the marine uh, side of things and sails and boat hauls and so forth, so on. So how does it work? You know, 
we're going to add it in. The wax is going to melt. It's going to release these 10 million fibers into every ton uh, of mix made, and it creates a 3D reinforcement uh, structure. So uh, that entire mat, when you lay it, however thick your asphalt is, you know, one inch to five inches, it's going to be reinforced from the top down in this three-dimensional uh, matrix. That's what gives it its strength. The ability of the fiber to uh, root into the liquid binder and then also to attach itself to some of the smaller particles is what gives it its pull-out capability. So uh, as that fiber is being coated by the liquid and uh, those fibrils are being formed, as you see in the upper left-hand corner, they're kind of like roots. They uh, root into the liquid binder. The ends uh, wrap themselves around the fine granules and really uh, brings this reinforcement home. I guess you think a little bit about uh, uh, you know, rebar. There's a difference between smooth rebar and the ribbed rebar. Well, the ribbed rebar gets uh, has a better uh, pull-out capability. And the same thing here with the aramid. You've got uh, both uh, the roots going on and the high strength fibers wrapping around the small granules. And, and, then, and that's how it really creates the, let's say the reinforcement in the binder itself. So the best and easiest way for us to tell you in a, in a simple term, what our product does when you add it to a mixture um, and, and this is after uh, five years of, uh, of testing at this point. Very simply, if you add our product to the base mixture, you're going to get a bump on the PG scale on the top and on the bottom. So you're gonna improve rutting and you're gonna improve cracking. It would be like taking a mixture that is a 6422, adding a dose of our fiber, and the mixture performing more like a 7028. So you're getting a bump on the top and a bump on the bottom. That's with a single dose. That performance will st be stretched even further if you add a double dose. So we talk about one of the, uh, one of the points of the triangle, uh, you know, as the polymer modification either becomes hard to get or becomes expensive here later in the, in the, in the season, using this uh, kind of technology where you can turn it on and off at the plant becomes a really uh, cost effective, probably in an easy way to not give up on performance that was expected out of the polymer modified oils, but to go to this technology and match it. Okay, so that's the easiest way for us to tell you what it does. And uh, the fact of the matter that it can replace polymer modified uh, binders uh, is, is got to be music to some of those producers ears out there that uh, that struggle with making that product. So let's go on into field validation um, of ASEXP and some of the projects we've done across the country. How is it looking? How is it performing? Um, we're going to start with uh, one of our largest uh, users of the product uh, since uh, 2015. Loves has been using ACE XP polymer fiber in their uh, new store build out. And that's been uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 stores a year for the last four years. And uh, so we have uh, over 200 stores now that have our product uh, in what I would call a pretty uh, tough environment. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's uh, a lot of truck traffic. And in most cases, there's only one entrance and one outlet. Uh, sharing a drive to most of these locations. So you've got a lot of concentrated easels. Um, and uh, the question just becomes, you know, how is it performing? Well, we're going to go to our very first store that was put down in Sadieville, Kentucky, not too far from uh, Phil down there, and take a look at how it's performing over the years and then compare that to another store that went in about the same time without the technology. And again, since 2016, all stores have been using Aramid uh, or Ace XP polymer fiber. And so we had to go all the way back to 15 to find one that didn't. So some construction pictures early on, typical uh, of most stores, uh, you know, they're kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and so they got to make a, you know, a way to get into the store. So a turn lane typically is added and uh, not a lot of traffic control in most places either, especially in a rural environment. So you have this uh, one entrance sharing in and out, if you will, of the store. Um, 
so the most critical part or the or the area that sees every bit of traffic is right there at that turn lane coming into the store and we've been tracking this uh, since the beginning uh, as you can see these pictures were uh, uh, taken after a, a full winter um, and again uh, other than tire marks everything looks great uh, no rutting no cracking if you look closely here underneath the truck you're starting to see some raveling going on in that county road that obviously doesn't have uh, aramid fiber or asex p polymer fiber in it if we fast forward so several years have gone by now uh, several winters here's what uh, sadieville looks like as of june of last year um, and Phil, you just walked this uh, uh, last week and you said there really wasn't uh, much difference after yet another winter. And that's, that's exciting news. Um, but here's what this looks like. There's still no rutting, no cracking at that traffic light or uh, stop sign. Um, it looks really, really, really good. So we said, okay, let's see how this is performing to a, a store close by. Knightstown, Indiana. Uh, it's about 100 miles, maybe a little bit more than that, north. Uh, it's outside of uh, uh, Indianapolis, about 40 miles to, uh, to the east. Uh, this was uh, uh, same uh, pavement structure, uh, 6422 oil, uh, you know, same thickness, put down the same time of within a couple months of each other. And this is how this job is performing. As you can see, uh, you know, certainly a lot of cracking is going on. Um, a lot of deterioration uh, back here in the back 40. They've actually already patched a fairly large section of this uh, of this parking lot. So certainly not performing anywhere close to the same level as uh, the Asex P polymer fiber section. From a rutting perspective, one of the toughest areas for loves to control is this uh, uh, the section butting up to rigid. You know this asphalt drive but butting up to the rigid. Uh, uh, concrete that they use at their fueling depots. Uh, as you can see, we have very minor uh, uh, rutting, at, if any at all here. Um, and the Knightstown job, well, it looks completely different. And uh, so for that reason, guys, and everybody on the phone, I mean, this is why Loves continues to use our product. Um, they, uh, they are now, uh, in certain circumstances, they are using a double dose in the surface mix as opposed to one dose. And uh, they are modifying uh, their use of polymer modified oils when doing that. So, uh, you know, they are going away from polymer modification and going to a double dose in that surface mix uh, to uh, provide that, uh, uh, that improved performance. And we'll look at that again here in a second. Okay. So city of Plainfield, Indiana, just outside of Indianapolis. The reason I like to show this, uh, this job is because it is ASEXP uh, in 7622 compared to no uh, ASEXP in 7622. And you'll see some cracking data here in a little bit uh, uh, as we uh, move through the next uh, bank of slides. But this is showing you after one winter, the difference that ASEXP can make. And so the, the 7622 um, is already starting to crack back. And yes, that's asphalt over concrete. As you can see, those concrete joints coming back. On the A side, they're not there. Um, these, uh, they, they did take some cores and they did run some IFIT tests. Uh, so we, we have some idea of just how uh, improved the, the crack performance was of this job. Um, Another set of pictures here. Again, very clearly, can you see the difference uh, between the ACE section and uh, the non-ACE section? You know, 7622 is not necessarily built to be a crack mitigator. It is really being used to handle heavy traffic and keep rutting from happening. And so the city is definitely sacrificing cracking for that stability, as Phil would say. So if you kind of look at the the, the crack count, uh, you, you would absolutely see that uh, uh, the control lane versus the ACE lanes are definitely uh, cracking much faster uh, just after six months of in, in install installation. Another job down in Kentucky, uh, this is uh, Project US 31. 
uh, W. This was actually the very first job that I got involved in back in uh, about June of 2015. And it's a four and a half inch overlay over uh, concrete. And uh, uh, the project uh, had several features to it. They were looking at some paving grids, some paving fabrics, some other things. So we did get a section on here. We're gonna concentrate on our section at this point. Uh, really, we did some crack counts over 2018 and 19. Uh, Phil was part of this, and thank you for that help, Phil. And uh, this is what it looked like in 2000, uh, or excuse me, in 2019. And I've got some pictures here of just earlier this year before uh, the shutdown. But as you can see, uh, and we would expect, um, this went down in 15. It's now 19, four years later, four and a half inches of thickness you know, an inch a year coming back through that crack is, you know, kind of a, a rule of thumb. We're starting to see that cracking coming back in August of 19. Um, and again, we're gonna show you the crack count here. So in 19, uh, 18 and 19, not a whole lot of cracking going on. We have some, okay. But uh, you can see that the cracking is starting to ramp up in a big way uh, and uh, in 19 on the, the control section. What I want to show you is the pictures that were taking, taken in March this year, and uh, we need to go back out and take some uh, uh, and do the, the the crack count again, but uh, not really supposed to be doing that at this point. So uh, that'll happen here as soon as we open back up. But as you can see, uh, we're really starting to see those cracks open up on the control lane, whereas over on the ACE lane, you can clearly see that it, uh, those cracks are start stopping as they get to the middle of the roadway and are not continuing on over to the ACE lane, nor are there any cracks from the other side of the ACE lane, the edge coming back to the center. So um, much like we would expect that 30 to 50% improvement in both cracking and rutting, we'll sh we're seeing that uh, in showing up in these, uh, these pictures here. The last job I'd like to show you is one that we did uh, with South Carolina DOT. This is uh, 6422, 5.2% uh, oil and a single and a double dose of ACE versus control. And uh, Patrick, by the way, is a very, very small town. It's It's got a, uh, a stop sign, I believe, maybe one traffic light there uh, uh, where the purple section starts. And so um, the way they did this job is they did both lanes, north and southbound, uh, the same way, then went to, uh, so it's the purple is the double dose, the orange is the single dose, and the black is uh, is the control section. Uh, and so I was again down on there, down there uh, right before uh, COVID hit. In fact, I was in South Carolina when uh, Ohio started closing schools. So uh, thankfully got back and everything uh, was, was safe for us. But these are the pictures I took while I was down there. And you can see the double dose uh, where the project begins uh, at that intersection and moves, uh, let's see, that would be north uh, towards me, uh, towards the screen here. And uh, that's the double dose in purple. Um, again, uh, four inches over PCC looks outstanding. There's really no cracking, uh, no rutting to speak of. Um, looks really, really good. And you go to the the single dose section, you are starting to see some cracking coming back. And it's very interesting, you can pick up immediately in these pictures, there was no milling. They went in and put this asphalt right down over the old and look at this crack coming right back through. It's just reflecting, coming right back uh, through that new section. But, uh, you know, so that's, as you get out here, it gets dissipated, but the cracks themselves are tight. Uh, they're not opened up. And uh, so, but certainly a difference between the two times the dose and the one time the dose. And now let's look at the control. Um, the control section is definitely more full width cracking um, and the, uh, the, the width of that crack itself. So the width of the roadway is, you know, it's going across both lanes and the width of that crack is actually wider. Um, so we are seeing this uh, difference in the field, and, and just to pull this up uh, and show it side by side, there's there there is a marked difference in performance between 
uh, these three uh, sections of roadway down there. Again, validating what we've been doing in the lab. So, yeah, Joe, just just yeah, to Bill. comment on that as we now switch over to this uh, poll question, um, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and launch the poll for us to, to ask folks what they can do to change a mix design to improve cracking. Then just to just to comment on that a bit. Uh, no real questions coming in at this point, so have you all read over that? And and by the way, the the two slash ten is two tenths more virgin liquid or two tenths more recycled. So I'll let you all work through that. But Joe, I, I appreciate companies like Surface Tech and others who, you know, not only do you, you make the claims, but your claims are not just based upon lab testing, which you've done an extensive amount of lab testing. Um, and your the documentation is unbelievable. If anybody on this wants to have a copy of your tech brief, it uh, started out as a page and I think it's how many pages now, Joe? I think 42, and there's still some more that needs to go in as soon as we, you know, get out of COVID and, uh, you know, University of New Hampshire goes back to work and then uh, uh, the folks down in Texas go back to work. So we got some unfinished business still, uh, but so it's going to get bigger, yeah. probably closer to so, 50. Yeah, and you're, and you're not afraid, one, of, of having it tested by, by anyone. The other thing is when you put it down in the field, uh, the lab testing shows, you know, 30 to 50 percent increase in, in performance, um, especially like in cracking, let's say. And then I go and I go to the field, I go to the lab, I see the same thing. So that's that's important to note that, um, you know, you, you back up your claims and uh, kudos to you guys on doing that. Joe, we have about 51 um, percent uh, voted. I'll, I'll leave it open here just for another bit. A few more folks are in there. And close this thing down here in about another um, another five seconds. This is one it takes a little bit more on, uh, Joe. <laughs> I had to sit here and read it to think about that. I was like, oh, Joe's asking a trick question. So uh, hopefully everybody got a chance to vote. I'm going to go ahead and close that now, and I'll share that out. There you go, Joe. Well, everybody, uh, the majority of folks uh, got it right. Uh, obviously, adding uh, 8.4 ounces will get there. but um, you know, adding a couple tenths of liquid binder will also improve cracking in most cases. So a bit of a, a, a trick question, uh, but uh, my mentor there, Mr. Phil Blankenship, has taught me that. And now I think that's real important to point out, Phil, that the mix design you're looking at may or may not even have room for another couple tenths. However, if you can get it in there, it will absolutely improve that cracking index on Ideal CT. So uh, you know, I think uh, a great question for that. And uh, why don't you go ahead and close that? Well, and get I, was some of add, test. I was gonna add this, Joe, that, you know, lowering the plant production temperature um, is definitely a way to do it too, but 20 degrees Fahrenheit <laughs> or 10 C, that doesn't make a lot of a difference. That's, that's by the way, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, I wouldn't even call that um, warm mix at, at 20 degrees Fahrenheit. That's no. more of just a, uh, an accident or a nudge, but uh, yeah, very well done, Joe. All right, thanks, Phil. All right, so, all right, so Phil spent some time in the beginning talking about balanced mix design. We've introduced good, better, best, and test. Um, and really, I want to bring some of that stuff forward now um, because the lab performance test really is the backbone to using all the, this innovation that I show here, and in is driving all of our innovation over here. Uh, we don't do anything without getting in the lab and seeing how it's performing. So let's let's start with Ideal CT. And for all you producers out there, these two tests kind of become or or should become a backbone to adopting our product in your own commercial uh, mix designs, uh, in which uh, Mike's going to talk about here shortly. So let's start with uh, uh, Ideal CT. It's real important, you know, as as the amazing thing about being in this industry for the last five years, when you go around, and you talk to individuals and, and DOTs are one thing, but so many uh, cities, uh, counties, municipalities, they rely on the DOT to put those mixed designs together. So if you ask them uh, to give you a quantitative description of their crack problem, they can't do that. Um, and, 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 and part of that reason is uh, they rely on the DOT to do that and put it together. And the DOT has the ability to run some of these more complex tests. Um, this is where Ideal CT really has, uh, is really changing things because it is something that can be run 
relatively quickly, relatively easy at a low cost, okay? And so they'll say, yeah, you know, hey, I'm getting cracking back on that two inch overlay and uh, uh, you know, if I get one winner out of it, I'm doing great. Well, you start equating that knowledge back to an ideal CT index. Now you can start to see, well, hey, my index value was 43 out there and it's cracking back two inches in, in six months. I think I know why. And that reason is I've got a dry mix or I certainly don't have a very well performing uh, mix from a cracking standpoint. So very important to know uh, exactly how crack resistant and rut resistant your mixes are. So some testing we've done. And uh, we're not going to show it all. We're going to highlight a few. Okay, it started uh, here with Pavetex uh, down in uh, in uh, uh, really the the testing started in 17, completed in 18. In uh, really ran two different kind of mix designs: a dense grade 6422 and a super paved mix uh, uh, 7622. If you look at the control uh, of, of the 6422, you're getting an index of about 55.4. Um, now, Fuji, uh, when he put his uh, uh, suggestions together for Texas, he kind of said for dense grade, the minimum you ought to be shooting for is 65. So their dense grade is falling a little short of that. Um, now, look what happens when we added a single dose of 38 millimeter ASEXP polymer fiber to that 64. We got a 36% bump or took that from really kind of performing below expectations, according to Fuji, to bringing it in line. Okay. And now that does have 20% wrap in it. Remember that project I showed you in Indiana that was cracking back uh, that 7622 just right after, you know, a winter? Well, here's why, uh, and this is pretty fundamental. We're seeing this over and over and over on a 7622. That again, it's not meant to be a crack resistant mix. It's meant to be a structural improvement for you know heavy use, uh, heavy ESO loads, anti rutting, all these things. And so, no wonder it's got a 25.1 index. And you know, you see then what we do when we add it. Well. We're, we, add, we improved at 58% by just adding ACE to it. That's why that job in Indiana makes sense with the data we collected here. Now, granted, different mixed designs, but same binder type, okay? So um, that's important to know. A, a, a job uh, that we just had run uh, from Christian County at uh, a, a KDOT job. So we're looking at uh, both a, a base mix and a surface mix. Um, so uh, in running ideal CT, and you see the controls there for base and surface 75.9 index and 79.5, relatively the same, but look what happens when we added, and this is plant mix, by the way, this was brought in uh, uh, from the producer and, and done in, uh, in the bat lab. Uh, and you, you, you can see what happens. We, we improved it to 48, you know, almost 50%. Um, now, this did have wrap in it. I, uh, I believe it was right around 20%. Uh, and these numbers, Phil, uh, are pretty dead nuts on as to what Kentucky's seeing uh, with their 20% wrap mixes, right? In that 70 to 80 range somewhere. That, and actually, actually, Joe, um, just sort of on a, on a non wrap mixture is probably closer to a 90 as they're adding asphalt at a climb a little bit more when they put uh, wrap in it. Uh, probably dropping into the 60s, 70s, and then with the 76, 22, some of them have gone into the 40 to 50 range. Just depends on the aging they put on it. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. And you know, as we're working uh, with the state of Kentucky and um, and they're considering all their options. I mean, Phil mentioned earlier, a lot of folks are looking at moving that index value up over 100. Well, you took a, a mix here that really wasn't performing where they wanted it to be. And now we've got it up over 100, almost to 120 in an index. That's a big deal. And and, and again, shows you that uh, adding aramid fiber or ASEXP polymer fiber to a mix becomes a tool to help balance these mixes out. Um, 
here's a job that we did over in uh, uh, Missouri for MoDOT. And this was kind of on a rural road. They can't, they, they double letter those uh, designations. So this was route BV, uh, MB uh, West contractors put this down. You can see the stats of the material itself, 5828. Uh, they did have uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, wrap and ras in this, nearly 30% combined. Uh, and again, we got a, an ideal CT back of 75.7 and we improved it 47%. So this, this 30 to 50% is not made up. This is all uh, tracking um, not only ideal CT, but we have run every one of the cracking tests that Phil showed earlier. And we're still, no matter how it's measured, we're getting that 30 to 50% improvement with a single dose of ACE. So we had, uh, this is a typical lab mix. This is uh, Phil's uh, uh, mix design that he was talking about earlier. It's not meant to be an overly aggressive uh, mixed design from a rutting perspective. Um, you know, it's for a medium volume dense grade road or medium volume uh, uh, roadway dense grade. Um, no wrap in this case, so 5.4% AC. Um, and then we look at a single dose and a double dose. And this is where the good and better are starting to show. So you, we, we took the 6422 without wrap got an ideal CT index of 90.1. We added a single dose, we got it up to 117. And then we added a double dose and we got it all the way up to 144. Phil, did you have something to add there? Um, yeah, on, uh, you know, what we did on that one, Joe, is that is a, just trying to take a mixture again, that's, that's, that's hitting like that 90, value and again no wrap in it uh, we're not trying to do anything uh fancy with it we're just just trying to understand you know what's the what's the effect if if i add the fiber and and what i see again it's it's the same effect i've seen with using this with um beam fatigue or any of these type of tests you put it in there and, and what happened was very little very little change in tensile strength maybe a slight change but what it's really doing is allows the mixture to elongate uh, without actually coming apart. And that and that's where it that fiber acts like that three-dimensional network to really hold together. And, and look what you see on a very conservative side. You saw the 30%. And then you and then you double it. Well, what's it do? Well, it 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 doubles the performance. And um, again, I continue to say no difference in what we would see in the field, Joe. Yeah. And so uh, building off your single and double dose that uh, you put up earlier, this this was actually a mix brought in um, from a Love's Travel Center up in Obetz, Ohio. And uh, this mix design was actually brought uh, into Love's from the same very similar mix design that the city of Columbus uses. And so uh, we were looking at this and, and we ran these values out um, for a single and a double dose. And as you can see, 6422, you know, a, you know, again, a typical according to Fuji would be around a 65 or a 70. We didn't have control because everything had fiber in it. So that's just kind of a place marker, but that's what we would expect that to be, you know, a 38% improvement. But you can see where the values are going up in both cases. And as Phil mentioned earlier, you know, a little polymer modification goes a long way when you add uh, aramid in it and uh, or ACE XP polymer fiber. So it ends up uh, really showing you, hey, there's something here and, and, and it becomes a tool to decide whether or not you want to use, um, you know, 7022, which is a polymer modified uh, or a double dose. And in this case, that's what we are trying to prove out. A single dose of 7022 has an index of 83. A double dose of 6422 has a much larger value there. And so this gives Loves the opportunity to look at modifying uh, their use of polymer modified blends and going to a double dose and, and feeling really good that they actually made a positive impact on their cracking performance at their facility. So that's one data point. The second one will be running. So let's move to that. So with cracking being the premature, uh, you know, or premier, if you will, problem in the U.S., you, you're going to want to start there. You're going to want to try to improve your mixes uh, from a cracking perspective, and then go back 
once you have it where you want it and run the Hamburg and make sure you haven't given your rutting away. That's the key to balanced mix design. So uh, again, the, the Missouri job, if you remember, we got almost a 50% increase in cracking. Well, as you can see here, um, in both the, at 5,000 passes and 10,000 passes, uh, the ACE XP well outperformed the control mix. So in this case, not only did they get crack improvement, they also got rutting improvement. Again, on both sides, 30 to 50% improvement on both sides, cracking and rutting. We showed you the, the single and the double dose uh, that we did a, a, a dosing study early on uh, with Phil's help in Asphalt Institute. Well, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, had started there and then we ended up moving it over to the bat lab at, at, at a, a, a different point here last year. But it, the, the point of the matter is here is you look at 15,000 passes, the rut depth was less uh, anywhere but from 28 to 45 percent, depending on the dosage, and then that rut depth, uh, you know, if you, or if you look at the total number of passes, anywhere from 19 to 32 percent, again, depending on uh, the amount of aramid that you put in there. Now, keep in mind, this was not meant to be a high rut resistant mix to start with, but we certainly improved it. And the goal here was to prove out the more uh, aramid we use, more ACE XP that we use, do we get incremental improvement on both cracking and rutting? The point of the matter is we do, um, which again becomes the, the, the backbone, the cornerstone of our whole uh, good, better, best and test program. Um, so the Love's Travel Center, I mentioned that, you know, they're getting improvement uh, in, in cracking, uh, you know, using a, uh, a double dose in 6422 and a single dose in 7022. Um, look what's going on with with the rutting side. You know, so at 20,000 passes, the 6422 single dose is 10.9. Okay, well, that doesn't really match up with 7022 with a single dose. How about a double dose? Oh my goodness, it's laying right on top of each other. So this testing has given Loves the ability to go into markets um, and know that they're looking for a certain performance uh, out of their surface mix with, with ACE and a binder type, and they've been used to polymer modification with ACE in it. And so now this gives them the opportunity where binder is gonna be hard to get a hold of. In some cases, they're in rural settings where modified binders are not purchased by those uh, producers that often. Um, and so it gets real expensive for them to bring in a tanker or pay for, uh, you know, you, you can't just buy a couple barrels of it, right? You got to buy a whole a tanker full. So all of these things go into driving that price up on modification in these rural environments. So uh, this gives Loves the opportunity to go back and forth and decide what's best for them uh, store by store location. So, uh, you know, again, uh, we're going to move into this idea of innovative new products. Well, Army uh, is one of those uh, innovative new products, and um, we're going to bring Phil in and, and let him talk with us through this. But, you know, uh, the idea of innovation and offsetting uh, oil costs, so forth, so on, uh, is also what we want to do is drive more tonnage through the plant. And so converting uh, any kind of geosynthetic interlayer over to a plant-made paver laid asphalt product has got to be good for the asphalt community, the producers and the pavers. Um, so, but what is ARMI? ARMI is, stands for Aramid Reinforced Mix Interlayer. It's a one inch thick asphalt reflective crack relief interlayer, RCRI, that is plant-made, paver laid, and improves cracking resistance anywhere from seven to 10 times that compared to standard asphalt mixes. So, um, and really this kind of came about uh, uh, as we look back over our testing since 15, we're really 14 when it all started, up to this time point in time, uh, Phil and I really had an idea that, hey, the more liquid asphalt you use, the more aramid you use, you know, you're getting some really incredible results here. And the reason for that is we're reinforcing the liquid, okay? And so, um, Phil, you were asked by uh, Hayden Materials on this job uh, to get involved, uh, to help them come up with a, 
uh, you know, kind of a 10 to 15 year crack free uh, overlay, uh, starting with this uh, inner layer idea. Uh, you want to share some of uh, some of the story here? Yeah, that's that's right, Joe. Um, it was about uh, probably about March of last year, and Hayden had bid uh, on that project and was really trying to get a a, a higher end inner layer down. And when they found out they were not able to get the supply that they needed, uh, they began looking and trying to understand. I went out and I was actually ex asked to go out and look at the project, and they really didn't have a heavy reflective cracking issue in in this case. Uh, this was a which is a little simpler uh, project. They had some issues with um, with very light cracking, as you're seeing, um, uh, just really aged pavement as it was sitting out there baking in the sun. And so they would just want to make sure that none of that would reflect through. And so by by uh, going together and, and doing this one, Joe, we didn't even pull out all stops. We just sort of put together what I call a poor man's inner layer. But even with that, it was still an incredible performer. Um, Inner layer uh, simply used a locally available 6422, but by changing the design, uh, the mix design uh, quite a bit, and then um, uh, making it uh, more of an inner layer type design, and then adding the the ASXP polymer fiber, we begin to see that effect of the of the polymer in the mixture. And this this went down. It was beautiful. It was very supported by a roller. Uh, it did not push. I mean, it was. Uh, matter of fact, you normally think you get about a quarter inch or um, four or five millimeters of of. Um, I'm going to start that since you yeah just go right ahead. mentioned it. Yeah, normally normally you get like a quarter inch of of compaction per inch of pavement or or four millimeters per 25 millimeters or so, uh, and that's typically what you expect to compact. This thing was very stout and it held up under the edge really really well. As you see there, it doesn't even look like it's moving. And uh, turned out to be a, a beautiful interlay. And if you were to pick that up, and you you would actually find out that's very bendable. And I know you've done those demos at the booth. It's it's not brittle. It's actually a very bendable pavement. Go ahead, Joe. Absolutely. And so you know, Phil, if I recall, and I think I had it on the title slide back there, you know, our ideal CT was above 200. And by just changing the mix design and adding a little bit more liquid using a non-polymer modified binder and uh, I believe a single dose of, of Aramid, we were able to take something, if they had put down traditional mix, we've already seen what that was in Kentucky, they were gonna get a, an ideal CT score down in the 70s, certainly below 90, and here we are up to 225. So really this is what led us to this idea of can we take it to the next level? What happens if we use a slight polymer modified binder? What happens if we improve uh, the dosage from a single to a double? Where can we drive the performance? And so Army was built, or, or, or if you will, the idea was hatched. And after uh, getting into the lab and, and doing our testing, uh, we, we formulated this product, this idea, and really this criteria. So, you know, the good, better, best and test program is all about uh, knowing your numbers. In this product, if if the mix design that is developed in South Carolina or California or Montana doesn't hit these criteria that we set up for uh, uh, ideal CT of 650 or you know running at uh, uh, 12 millimeter rut depth at 5,000 passes, it will not pass our product offering. And so. Um, we're setting a, a really a product up to be designed one at project at a time with local producers uh, using locally sourced materials and binders. Um, part of our uh, going to market uh, offering with this is to provide uh, mixed design validation back through the bat lab. So uh, all of those materials uh, locally sourced would be shipped down to Kentucky. Um, and Phil and uh, Zach will get into the mix design validation, run Ideal CT in Hamburg, um, give that mix design back to the producer, which he is now ready to go into production. We'll then pull uh, plant mix, do the same thing again. Once we're in production, make sure that we're hitting all those numbers. Um, and so all of that's tied into the product we call Army. And it's gonna use a varying um, amount of, uh, as we call it, Army Aramid, 
uh, you know, depending on if we're hitting these numbers or not. So we know that uh, the more Aramid we add, the better the, uh, the performance will be, uh, but we're gonna guarantee those minimum performances that are in that table. Um, the other things that are included in the Army package, plant blending equipment, delivery of the Army Aramid uh, into the, the mixing drum, whether it be a continuous drum or a, a pug mill at a batch plant. Uh, we offer the training and certification of the blending. Um, and then we also offer a certified blending report if desired. So much of what we do on the A side uh, from a plant interaction standpoint is brought forth in the Army package. But here's the gradation, Phil, and this, this is what uh, really made the difference, right? As, as we got into looking at, um, and, and from your past design work, it, it's all about this fine gradation, um, improving uh, the amount of asphalts in there, controlling your VMA, and also, uh, you know, looking at your voids at 50 gyrations. I mean, all of those things together is, is really the brilliance of the product before we even put Aramid in it, correct? I was on mute there, Joe. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Joe. And yeah, yeah and, and again, you're looking at a mixture here why it says 7 to 10 percent asphalt. Uh, this one probably had closer to probably about 8, 8.5% eight in it for yeah. this project. And so there's the fine grain, uh, as we call it, fine uh, looking. It almost looks like black sand, uh, but certainly went down beautifully, had a stout edge, as, as Phil says. Now, being an inner layer, and, and, and recognizing that, uh, you know, 5,000 passes to get uh, 12 and a half millimeters of rut depth isn't necessarily a stout rutting uh, performance. And it's not intended to be because it's intended to be uh, below the wearing course. And so depending on your easel count, uh, we have minimum overlay thicknesses also uh, suggested for the product. So you know, a rural road or uh, parking lot maybe uh, uh, for cars, uh, one and a half inches uh, up to uh, interstate greater than 30 million easels, you're looking at three and a half inches over the top. But let's talk about the benefits of Army for those uh, producers out there or installers. I mean, one of the trouble, uh, one of the biggest issues with the geosynthetic uh, lay down uh, procedure is it's typically through a third party. It's not controlled by the producer or paver. It's an extra step. Uh, it tends to slow down the paving process when they're ready to go. And as we know, uh, the lay down process of asphalt has its own issues with weather, this, that, and the other. And man, when you're ready to go, you wanna go and you don't wanna have uh, this other process slowing you down. And so um, it removes that, it puts the control back uh, with the producer and paver. Uh, from an engineering perspective, uh, we're going to reduce the water penetration to the subgrade. Um, the water will not pass through that, uh, that inner layer. Uh, so if you have cracks below that we're trying to mitigate from coming back up through that inner layer, uh, you're not going to get water down through those open cracks. Um, and for that reason, you're, you're, you're going to improve the bottom up performance of your surface, right? Those bottom, those cracks aren't gonna make their way back up through the inner layer. It improves the surface mix performance uh, to the point that it will stay in uh, for the second surface mix. So if you put it down on an interstate and you put three and a half inches of surface on, you go back in seven to nine years, you're gonna put a new surface on, you mill down to the army inner layer. Uh, you can inspect it if you want, but more than likely, uh, it'll be very crack free and you just put down another uh, uh, lift of, of surface mix on it and get on down the road. I, I think one of the other interesting uh, things as we talk about Army and what it can do, you know, so many of the really expensive projects, uh, you know, your capital improvement projects, um, you know, they're full depth reclamation because that pavement is so far gone that you're going to have to re, you know, start over. You know, this, this product may allow some of those really tough conditions to be moved over into uh, the overlay program um, instead of digging it all up and starting over. So um, it's, you know, from a, from a design perspective or really a, a producer looking at a job and saying, hey, there might be a better way to do this, Army might be there. So again, the, the real important thing about Army is it's a producer paver controlled operation it's plant made, paver laid, 
and we're using asphalt. We're using those assets at the producer's yard to create an incredible product. Phil, let's go on to poll number four. Are you on mute again? Oh, there you go, Joe. <laughs> it's all <laughs> set. Go right ahead, folks, and uh, go right ahead and and uh, I like begin with that. Yeah, Phil, what do you yeah, think? Go ahead uh, and begin you, with that. You, you want to use more wrap or not? Huh? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to see more recycled asphalt pavement used if blank. What was the Joe, name of that game show that used to do that? Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah that was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember anyway. that, and that was a uh, that was uh, you going back to the '70s there, Joe, or '80s. Yeah, I'm starting to show my age a little bit. So, so as uh, folks fill that out, we are approaching the uh, the the top of the hour. But like any uh, good webinar, we're going to run over uh, just a bit. Uh, a lot of information to convey here, but as as you all, uh, hopefully everybody is able to stay on. Uh, what do you think you're going to have, Joe, to finish up about? 15 minutes or so. Yeah, so so 15, 20 minutes. Quarter after, 20 after, we should be done, yeah. Oh, that's good. So if you folks can stay on with us, that would be great. It's awful quiet on the questions today. If anybody got any questions, let us know. But uh, thanks, Joe, for going through the, the details there. And a lot of information you're sharing there with the uh, the different uh, products. And I, and I think the you know, biggest takeaway I get, again, is you're only talking about dense grade and you've talked about inner layers, but any mixture, uh, we, we, there's folks that's asked, you know, could I put this in my, in my mixtures um, and, and maybe offset uh, uh, wrap uh, and use it to assist with wrap? Absolutely. Could I put it in thin lays? Uh, can I use it in a thin lay mixture and expect improvement? Yes. Uh, can I put it, uh, you know, name your mix. Can you put it in and make it better? Absolutely. And that's what this is. Think of it again as a as a dry uh, polymer. Okay, Joe, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we've got just a few more voting here. And I'm going to close this down here in just another moment. Okay, and let me share this out. There you go, Joe. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Why so you improve frack resistance and lower costs. So everybody wants the best of both worlds. Um, and, and, and hey, we agree with that. The reason I put this question in the way I did is because I'm going to share with you what we're doing at the R&D table right now. And actually, um, all of these are possible. It all depends on uh, what uh, the specifier is looking for and uh, how we tweak uh, the mix designs to get there. So, Joe, uh, yeah. I want to point out, you know, of course, same crack resistance, lower cost. Um, that's people being tolerant. Then you got the flip side of that, which is never. It's sort of like I'm just fed up with it. Oh and, yeah, there uh, is 12% that said never, and and rightfully so because yeah. you know in the past we're going to talk about that. It didn't really go so well, did it? And, and I bet you those are some folks from Canada because they don't use a, a lot of wrap up there uh, because of the cold because it does create a stiff mix. So. Um, but as we move into this potential issue at the end of the year, a lot of times when oil has gotten expensive or binder has gotten expensive, we have played with using more wrap as an alternative. We know how to do it better today than we did 10 years ago. And let's talk about that. So what if we could use more recycled asphalt pavement in our mixed designs, but not give up the performance or maybe even improve the performance over its, uh, lower uh, percent wrap cousin mix design. So now I think this is important, you know, and that's where the 12% was coming from, Phil. It's like, hey, maybe we've done this before. We know this doesn't work. You promised all these things, right? Reduce uh, the, the cost of asphalt pavement in general, but you're gonna do that through reducing the virgin binder use. You know, maybe I can get rid of some of the polymer modification, you know, uh, I'm reducing the need for the expensive aggregate or really the scarce aggregate resource that's going on throughout the country. You know, I can pave more roads, same budget. I can reduce the mountains of wrap in my in the producer's yard. That's a big deal to these guys. Um, and then, you know, also reduce the CO2. You know, all of these things were promised. But what happened was really there was a lack of performance in cracking, um, adding more more wrap taking out uh, uh, 
the binder contribution that the wrap brought in. So removing virgin binder to compensate, um, you know, ended up creating some stiff mixes. And from that standpoint, really, really good from a rutting perspective, but really created some, you know, premature cracking. And so as part of this whole theme of this webinar is know your numbers, use the balanced mix design. Yeah, it was a great idea then. It's even a better idea now when we add these missing links into it. What we didn't do then was apply balanced mix design approach. What we didn't have then were these performance testers or these, these performance testing to drive that design. We didn't have ideal CT. And if we had Hamburg uh, without a crack test, well, they would have been really happy with the, the Hamburg results, adding all that wrap in there, right, Phil? <laughs> it would have been really good. We didn't have anything to really offset it from a cracking standpoint. Oh, well, that's right, Joe. And then what we didn't have then is what we have now in these great uh, plant introduced additives like our ASEXP polymer fiber or like a liquid binder modifier, those bio oils that Phil mentioned. Uh, these, these products combined do some wonderful things together and I'm gonna share that with you. So the result of kind of this old idea and putting a new pair of pants on it and saying, hey, it lo it's looking pretty good. The results are, hey, you can take a 20% wrap mix design and make it become close to 40, maybe even last longer, you know, it, it, and it's lower in cost. So what we've been able to do by using this, this approach is this. And uh, so this is uh, uh, a job that we've been working on uh, with a client down in Kentucky. And uh, the control mix is 5.6% uh, liquid AC. It's a 6422 PG binder, 20% wrap. So just a dense grade mix. The average ideal CT uh, index was 55.9. So what we want to do is add uh, up the, you know, we tried, we shot for 38, the, 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 or excuse me, shot for 40, came in uh, right around 38%. Uh, with the aramid and the, and the binder modifier uh, from a uh, from a volumetric standpoint. So what we did was tried two different liquid uh, amounts. So knowing that they use 5.6 in their standard design and we're upping the wrap so much, we went to 5.8. We actually added a couple tenths of uh, of AC and true to Phil's word, when that happened, look what happened. The, the you know, along with the aramid and along with the binder modifier, all once we got some pretty good results in cracking. Um, and uh, so then we said, okay, let's go to the other side. Let's, let's take a 10th out. And uh, you can see we still beat uh, the control with almost 40% wrap using aramid, uh, using ASEXP polymer fiber and a bio oil. Okay, now what's going on on the cracking side? You can see that we're improving the cracking side or excuse me, the rutting side as well. So we're getting improved performance on both sides by using our available mechanisms that we have in place with performance testing and these modifiers that can be added at the plant. So no longer does the, does the, the contractor or producer have to be so um, uh, you know, one-sided in thinking, yeah, it's either aggregate or it's or it's asphalt, right, Phil? It's it's one or the other. No, we got all these other ways of doing it now. So right there, this is where we say let's use more wrap because we have the best way now to know how to design with it, and the products and the methodologies are there to ensure that it performs as good or better depending on what you want done in your backyard. So. What do you think, Phil? It's pretty exciting, isn't it? So I, I keep muting Joe. Go right ahead. <laughs> and, and I'm not so sure I'm not automatically muting you uh, myself here as we're sharing the screen. But uh, you know, what we want to do is use these technologies to offset the the potential high costs of of the binder as it moves forward. But I think it also gives us an opportunity here to put some better mechanisms in place long term. It may be out of necessity that we go towards these innovative ideas, but I think they're going to have some staying power 
once folks uh, get their arms around uh, the capabilities of uh, combining all this testing with uh, uh, with the products that are available and and uh, you know getting rid of the wrap using less oil being more responsible from a co2 emission standpoint all of these things a green sustainability uh, story just you know it's it's all coming together in a perfect storm so um, so how do you as a as a producer use these technologies to offset the high cost of oil itself let's talk through that a little bit so uh, one of the first things we got to do is is know the cracking and rutting numbers that we talked about early on of your asphalt mixes and then we got to look at the solution to the problem you know each problem might be a little bit different each one of these cracking mechanisms are different they can be uh, 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 solved with a, a different amount of air emit, a different mix design, blah, uh, and so forth, so on. So, um, so one size does not always fit all. So that's that's an important point. The second point is cost. As you mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, the best engineered solution is the one that takes care of the problem at the least cost. And so, as we talk about good, better, best, and we compare again the the ideal CT numbers that uh, we've seen so far, um, and then look at what a two and a half inch overlay might cost using various interlayer products. So a paving fabric, about $3 a square yard installed to a typical paving grid, you know, might be seven to $10 installed. Um, and you look at a single dose and two and a half inch overlay, under $2. Look at a double dose under four dollars, and then you look at using the double dose of Army plus the improved uh, amount of asphalt that's going to go in it. You're in that four to five dollar range, and so it's very uh, the technology is very affordable compared to other interlayer products that are out there, and it uh, is something that you want to match the 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 right performer to the right uh, solution. So. On top of everything else, life cycle cost analysis, we need to understand what does this mean long-term? And so if we look at ACE XP and we look at a, uh, and by the way, this calculator is out on our website, please go play with it. Everything in blue, you can type in um, and uh, you can uh, uh, get your own answers, okay? So um, just kind of walking through this, it's a 20 year period. We got a 12 foot wide uh, lane width, one mile long discount rate of 4% and uh, what is that? That's underneath my, yeah. And then the rate uh, pounds per cubic foot of the asphalt uh, uh, buck 45. So when we go through this, uh, you know, $80 a mixed ton for 64.22 dense grade, that's kind of an average cost over here in the Midwest. Um, we added $9 a plant ton mix for adding Ace XP to that. We added uh, $18 to go to a double dose. And then, uh, we're seeing 70, 28, again, it's a bump on the top and a bump on the bottom, um, you know, five to seven to $8, if you will, per uh, bump. So roughly about the same price as going to a double dose. And you can see down here, after you go through your calculations and you discount sal salvage and your salvage life expected years. So uh, state of Kentucky says uh, their average surface mix is lasting nine years. Okay, so 30 to 50% improvement, I use 30%. I went up 12 uh, to 12 years, up three, uh, three years on that. And then 60%, uh, then I went up uh, you know, five years for the double dose. And the, the polymer industry would say three to five years as well. Okay, so, and then you, you calculate all that out and you can see that, hey, uh, the double dose actually gives a little bit better uh, bang for the buck long-term than the single dose or certainly the polymer modification. So let's turn to Army. Army is another uh, way to look at this. Um, and, uh, you know, 6422 across the board. But then with Army, I'm going to put, uh, 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 you know, the inner layer down and ACE in the, in the surface mix. Okay. So I'm giving you the best product there is um, out there. And so in $150, a plant ton mix is probably overstated, but let's leave it in there. 
Um, as you can see, we use the same numbers as we did before, 150 for the Army with ACE surface. Um, this is a four and a half inch overlay, by the way. And uh, again, looking at uh, the I-30 or the, the US-31 in Kentucky, it was cracking back four, four inches and in, in really four years, four and a half inches in four years. So I used that and I said, well, I'm gonna improve it uh, a year using ACE, okay? And then I'm gonna improve it a couple years using a double dose of ACE. But look what happens out here. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna add 10 years to that performance when I go to this combined method. And that drives the, you know, the, the life cycle cost analysis of, of the Army product. So again, these uh, are out on our website. Feel free to go play with them. Um, and really what I've done to this point is I've set this up to walk through pulling this all together, and then I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Mr. Scardina here for a minute and let him talk through the commercial uh, program that he's instituted in Denver. So, um, so it's this simple, know your cracking numbers, know your running numbers of your existing designs, get in the lab and add in ASEXP in a single and a double dose, know what that is. Evaluate your current project for the best solution to take care of the problem. Pick the best solution, a single or a good, better or best solution that fits the budget and uh, make it happen. It's, it's actually that simple, but it's all backed up by science. As, Phil, uh, as Steve mentioned in the beginning, uh, we're not hoping and praying. We wanna get in and we wanna solve the problem uh, the best way we can using science, not a hope and a prayer. So. Uh, with all that said, we put this usage table together that marries the cracking, uh, the anticipated need for crack uh, protection on given cracking solutions. So moderate cracking, maybe you only need a mix that's gonna give you a 90 to 115 uh, ideal CT. When you start getting into uh, you know, more alligator cracking, this, that, and the other, maybe you better bump that up a smidge. Okay, and then, hey, I'm gonna put asphalt down over concrete. Well, we're saying plus 650 because obviously um, Army Interlayer is giving that. So this pretty much is a, a single dose of ACE, no matter the, the ESOL load, until you get down to 30,000 and recognizing that in a lot of cases uh, on interstates, at least in the Midwest, they're using 76 oil. So we're being conservative here but let's go with a double dose of ACE at 30,000. And then you'll see if you want more cracking protection to solve a, a, a severe cracking problem, we're gonna add more ACE in there all the way down. So that's a double dose. And then of course, uh, you know, asphalt over uh, concrete, it's all gonna be played uh, out with regards to the amount of easels uh, as to how much, uh, uh, surface mix you're putting down over the top of the one inch army. So uh, in all cases, uh, we are using uh, army with ACE XP polymer fiber, a single dose in the surface mix. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Scardina. Are you still there, my friend? It's been a long time and you may have gone to sleep. I don't know. Oh no, and, oh no, ready to go. Yeah, so uh, Mike uh, joined Surface Tech here back in the fall. Uh, but he's been involved with the product for uh, uh, quite some time, uh, more than that, as he was at uh, uh, one of our distributors at Nilex for a couple years. So uh, Mike's been uh, involved in this for the past uh, three years, uh, starting, I think, the fourth uh, uh, construction season. And he has a unique way of working with his producers in Denver. And I wanted him to share that uh, as we're, we're seeing this kind of work out in, in other markets as well. And so, uh, Mike, with that, I'm going to let you uh, talk through a couple slides here. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much, Joe and Phil. Uh, what I'd like to touch on today is some of the things we've learned over the past couple of years working uh, directly with the producers. Um, some of the producers have been introduced to the product and the program through uh, public agency work, and uh, we put our heads together to try to see if we could move that metric into uh, more of the outside sales or into their own commercial paving operations, covering everything from schools and, and institutions, non-street government 
type owners all the way to uh, long-term commercial industrial type properties. Uh, we start sort of on the same page though, where our idea is to take your workhorse mix, your half inch surface, your three quarter inch surface, um, take a look at how those are performing. Uh, also then put in the ACE fiber, run it and do some testing to identify and qualify and quantify the performance enhancement in that individual producers, that plants mix. Uh, it, as Joe's been talking about these different projects, you notice there is a little bit of variability. Everybody's mix is a little different. Everyone's plants a little different. And so to define that for uh, each individual company is a very important step. Um, it also allows us to take a look at those high wrap mixes. Uh, not every producer has a rock source that they own. Not every producer is in an area where binder is readily available and the different grades are easy to come by and or their plant is equipped for multiple binders. So we're able to take a look at uh, bringing in our technology, uh, getting a defined benefit, and then moving that onto a price sheet, actually going out to market with a premium product. Um, and of course, uh, uh, having that be part of the sales team. And, and that's where the co-marketing comes into play. I, I think we've, we've, we've established thoroughly our technical and our uh, operational uh, elements here. But it's important to understand that surface tech is also dedicated to having success through the sales of the producer. Um, it's our mission to educate the sales team, to educate the company personnel how to go after the paving fabrics. On a personal level, it would make me very happy to never see Petromat go down again. Uh, it's there's risk there, as Joe was talking about. There's third parties involved. It adds complication. It adds time uh, on commercial projects. Um, the, because of the size of the commercial projects, parking lots and things, uh, it can be very expensive, even in comparison to a uh, roadway project. And uh, taking those dollars and putting them back through the plant uh, can have a great deal of value to a producer. And, I think that feeds well into that army discussion versus the geo interlayers. Um, you know, there's some solid products out there, everything from a, a rubberized chip seal to uh, the glass grid and the various uh, SAMI type interlayers, uh, but they have disadvantages as well. They don't provide structure, they are expensive, and oftentimes, again, you're dealing with third parties. Um, and that's a lot of dollars out of the project budget that are not running through the plant. And uh, educating the sales team to, to identify these opportunities, uh, using the tools like the chart Joe had just introduced, um, and, and, and actually bringing in options for the, for the client so that they can make an educated decision uh, in addition to potentially having some cost savings is, is a very important component of our program. Uh, as these bullet points are describing, the co-branded media is a piece of this. It's important for us, depending on how the producer interacts, whether it's a flyer to go along with quotes, uh, building a webinar, doing uh, a in-person lunch and learns, whatever is required, we are going to go ahead and make sure that the tools come to market uh, under the brand of the producer, um, under the brand of their uh, mix. Um, we have some folks who consider things like private labeling, i.e. calling it something that they want to call it, or they can call it, you know, their mix with ACE. Whatever makes sense for the marketplace, we want to support that. We want to make sure that the media and the, the, the discussions and the sales team efforts are supported with the tools they need that way. And when it comes to executing, you know, we're here on multiple levels as well. 
the tech support, obviously, with the testing that we do. Uh, we also help um, with uh, producers who are moving into balanced mix design and purchasing, as, as Phil was describing, you know, hey, you're going to get a machine that's going to do ideal CT. We're here to help you get it set up. We're here to help with recommendations. We're here to help so that your operation can be successful. Uh, when it comes to design and value engineering, uh, we're also here uh, to help out uh, depending upon the particulars. Uh, one of the things that you know we can do is analyze a job for you to then make recommendations that can go back out through the sales team. And hopefully uh, with a combination of that type of support, really bring success into the organization and have it be a sustainable part of the revenue stream. And the last point of working with producers to get the project scheduled for training and equipment to blend, you know, that's a key thing where all this is great, but you have to get it through the plant. And we have a lot of experience working with producers all over the country, uh, in other countries, different kinds of plants, different manufacturers, different batch and configurations. Uh, we're able to integrate for success and get the amount of product needed and the type of equipment in, get the people trained, and again, build a sustainable program that is an asset to the operations and helps drive long-term profitability. Uh, and that's where we're coming in on these results. You know, we are taking a product and building a program. Being able to upsell that value uh, is a really uh, wonderful thing for a, a, a producer who's typically making, again, a couple of products. They've got your half inch, you got your three quarter, and that's uh, like peanut butter and jelly. You know, they're, they're standard type products. This is a way to build a premium product line from them. Uh, when they talk about gaining improved credibility and building a dialogue for service mm -hmm. life, um, it's not that the other products are bad, it's that, you know, asphalt cracks. And here's a way for us to come and address it and have significant contribution uh, without having to reinvent the wheel. You can take your mix and get a higher performing product and bring it to market and add value to your clients. And having the performance testing is very critical. Um, it's one thing to, to look at mixes and, and testing that's been done in, in other areas and use that to extrapolate performance. And it's another thing to say, hey, our mix tests at X. And we can say to a client that if they spend 10% more, they're going to get 25% more crack resistance or 40% more crack resistance, et cetera. It's, it is a critical step and it's something that we definitely support. Uh, Again, that upselling is something that not everybody's used to doing, and so it's it's a, it's critical that we support that effort through training and education with staff, as well as the customers. We can go to the customers with staff as far as pre preventing, pre uh, excuse me, presenting uh, lunch and learns, things like that. Back when we could all sit in the same room, and uh, and. Coming back to that paving fabric, that is the area where we've had the most success. Um, I think there's a good portion of the paving community that hates paving fabric and is looking for a better way. And it's kind of the low hanging fruit. So uh, it becomes a way to, uh, again, bring that money back into the plant. And uh, I, th I think it's been well embraced. Michael? You, uh, yes. you you mentioned about the support, and, and that is something that's very impressive with Surface Tech and, and the level of support you guys uh, will will give, uh, whether, whether you're, you know, beginning to early discussions at the plant or the, even the follow-up. And, and I want to mention that, too, because uh, we have uh, Michael Simons on um, and, and quite a few folks up in Canada. Um, the support in, up there too is, is offered. So not only not only here in the in the U.S. but also in Canada, and a special call out to Michael and, and team up there for uh, what they can provide. Yeah, and I know that uh, in Ontario, uh, the team has started to get some good success here, where they have again producers who may have been introduced 
to the product, to the process a year or two ago with a public project and have been able to build from that uh, into a more everyday opportunity level. And it's very exciting. Um, it does um, allow, again, for a lot more revenue to be driven through the plant. Um, and uh, uh, with some of these value adds that we've been discussing with high wrap, smart wrap, uh, really trying to drive um, uh, the, the, the performance angle without having to completely redesign everything that's going on around you, whether it's the mixed design, whether it's the aggregate choice, whether it's the binder, op binder availability, et cetera. So I uh, appreciate your time, everyone. And if you have any questions on the commercial side, please shout out. I'll start uh, checking in on that. And I think Joe has one more section to go through to get into the plan integration. Thanks, Mike. And uh, the bottom line is when 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 plants are instituting this, it's it's really a win win. Um, you know, we're we're able to work as a partner with these uh, with these producers. Uh, they learn a whole lot about uh, how to use our product. They also learn a whole lot about their own product. <clears throat> and as Mike said, the the real key is, is knowing the numbers. Uh, you know, certainly from a cracking standpoint. Uh, gives them a lot of confidence to go out and 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 and, and upsell, which is again something they're not always uh, uh, doing in a uh, uh, commodity type business. So, uh, shout out to Mike and uh, and and uh, uh, both Mikes, Mike uh, Scardina and Mike Simons, who are making that happen, along with Dave Hughes up in Ontario as well. So, let's talk about uh, plant training and blending. Just a few slides here, and we'll be uh, we'll be done. <clears throat> I mentioned uh, through. Uh, the webinar that uh, we typically go in through the wrap collar of a of a mixing drum, and that's exactly where we go in. We can also uh, ride up on the wrap belt itself, uh, whichever way is the easiest to reach. Not every plant is configured in the same way, but if all things are equal, uh, we'll drop the hose down through uh, the wrap uh, collar on the produce uh, on the continuous drum machine. Uh, when it comes to a uh, a batch plant. Uh, we like to go into the way hopper, which is uh, where all the uh, uh, dry ingredients are brought in and weighed uh, proportion before it goes into the pug mill. And that typically gives you about, uh, you know, 45 to maybe 60 seconds to get all the product up there uh, where it's then dropped into the pug mill and, uh, and blended together. So, you know, we have three ways of blending at the plant. Uh, full automation, uh, you're going to see a product uh, picture here of uh, the MD3. Um, it is uh, the, the most automated of everything we do. Uh, it's about $30,000 USD if you want to buy it or about $400 a day rental. Um, it requires one technician kind of part time because really always there is, uh, is to add product to the hopper and just uh, check in on the machine every once in a while, make sure that it's everything's working fine. Uh, the hopper holds a one, one uh, box, which is 40 pounds or 152.3 tons of production, okay? Um, the machine itself, it tracks the number of tons made, the total weight of product added that day and the average dosing rate that day. So it's, uh, it's really a convenient way uh, to know how you're dosing, keep track of it, uh, this, that, and the other. Um, you can download a report at the end of the day that gives you the day's production. Uh, we also use TeamViewer on that machine where you can actually uh, start and stop uh, the machine, change uh, uh, speeds at the plant, all from uh, a, a smartphone or a, uh, 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 another computer in the pilot house. So, um, so it's not integrated necessarily straight into uh, the software of the plant, but it can be controlled from the pilot house, which is another plus. Now that machine does come in in a trailer with a slide out, and you'll see that here in a, sh in a second. Our second machine is what we call partially automated. It's basically the front end of the MD3, uh, which you'll see here shortly, but it requires a full-time technician, somebody to load the product in the way bucket every, uh, every single dose. Uh, it's still uh, run by a computer, so it tracks everything that MD3 does. Um, but what's nice about this is it doesn't come in, come in a trailer. It weighs about 60 pounds, uh, and you can move it around in the bed of a pickup truck. Okay, so um, you know we uh, we as a company we use all three of these methods. 
uh, to, to provide dosing, uh, depending on the size of the project. Um, the last one is the full manual method, which is line back delivery system. It's our least expensive uh, product, about $5,000, a couple hundred dollars a day in rental. But this does require two technicians, one the way and one the meter of the product. And then the daily records are not kept by computer because there's not one there, so you got to do it manually. But here's what these uh, products look like. This is the MD3. Uh, like I said, it comes in a, in a trailer and it's pulled out into place. Um, let's see here. What I got? We are way late. Um, with regards to how we uh, integrate at the plant, we have a training module that we put together for this stay at home time. Uh, typically, we would also be at the job site uh, helping uh, operators at the, at the asphalt plant. Uh, in fact, learn how to use the equipment. Jesus. Uh, we have a video here, which I'm going to go through. Come on. And then uh, here's the here's the mini. Uh, like I said, it, it's it's basically the front end of the MD3 with a computer, and it's very lightweight, can be moved around. And here's the line back. Uh, you have a person that stands here and weighs out the por portions, and you have another person metering it into the funnel, which then goes up uh, through the hose into either the wrap collar or into um, uh, the way hopper. Lastly, I mentioned it early on, want to reemphasize it, there is no changes in the paving, the detailing, or the compaction. When you, uh, so the ease of adoption of our product is seamless. Um, we provide the tools to get there, not only from a design standpoint, but a production standpoint. Um, really, it's, uh, it's the easiest thing uh, to introduce into the plant that a lot of these guys have ever seen. So with that, Phil, take us to our last poll question. Okay, Joe. Uh, so for poll number five, with the information provided today, what Surface Tech would like to get from you is, uh, would you consider adopting a Surface Tech Aramid pavement solution? And just give some feedback there and the good guys at Surface Tech will follow up with you. I'm going to launch that now. And uh, Joe, as uh, you guys begin to close us out, uh, go right ahead. I, and just from my side, I just want to thank again, everybody, uh, for joining us today. Uh, apologize for going a little bit long. As you see, a lot of information to convey. And hopefully, everybody has found it very worth your while. Um, always learn something new. And uh, Mike, Michael uh, Scardino, is great to uh, hear your perspective on this, too. Go right ahead, Joe. Well, I appreciate it, Phil, and, and uh, this will conclude our uh, third of three uh, webinars, and I uh, really appreciate all the attendance over the last six weeks, and uh, a heartfelt uh, shout out to all of us getting back to a, a normal way of life. It would be great. Um, still, everybody stay safe. Um, be vigilant, as uh, Steve said in the beginning. Take care of yourself and your families. And uh, we'll see you out there on a paving project at some point. Steve, I think you probably have some closing comments. Um, yes, I do, but it's it, it's kind of running long, and I want to keep it very brief. So you know, the, the the team's done a good job of sharing a lot of pertinent and relevant information, mostly also to kind of keep an eye on what's happening with regard to raw material uh, availability and how that's going to impact your decisions as you get into the summer and the latter part of the summer. And remember, you've got uh, solutions coming from Surface Tech that are proven. They are, they are not, uh, you know, let's try it out and hope for the best. These are, these are uh, tested and invested solutions that will help you both with regard to uh, PMB alternatives, with regard to use of high wrap, and, and with regard to the elimination of grid and uh, the use of an inner layer material that is producer made and paver laid. So um, programs that are also involved, Mike's gone through that. I think that uh, is very um, worthwhile to investigate a little bit more and know that uh, we are there at the ready for you and appreciate your time today and uh, look forward to seeing you out in the season as uh, it starts to unfold even more so. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Hey, Phil, you want to show the results of that poll here? And then we'll close it out. There you go. Let's see here. 
So uh, yeah, about 13%. Yes, I have the perfect client or project in mind. 6%, probably two or three folks here. I haven't looked how many were still on. Uh, I have a small pilot project Pilot project get started. Maybe 44% uh, of most of the folks that want to share it. No, they're doing good right now. And then other, I'm not sure what other is, but uh, we should ask that one. Could well, be but, anything. I like other, Joe. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and of course, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see those, uh, you know, opening up uh, their thought process. And we really appreciate uh, that. And uh, we'll uh, pl pl please reach out to us. And uh, one of us will be happy to get back with you. Uh, with regards to uh, taking the next steps using our technology. We appreciate the day. Thanks so much for your time. Everybody be safe. Goodbye for now.